All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be your moderator tonight. The College of Complexes meets every Saturday night at uh, six o'clock right now via Zoom. And you can find the link from our website at collegeofcomplexes.org. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Then we'll have our speaker who is David Swanson tonight, who will then be able to speak up to about an hour or thereabouts. And uh, afterwards, we'll have a question and answer period. During the question and answer period, we ask that you keep it to questions because after the question and answer period, you'll have a certain amount of time, usually about five minutes to rebut the speaker on or off subject. And if we follow our traditional formats, I'll usually wind up timing everything. So at that point, keep it concise. We try to wrap up by nine o'clock, but if we're going on a little longer, that since we're on Zoom and don't have to worry about a restaurant closure or anything else, we'll be more than happy to accommodate anybody else and stay on board. Um, there's two rules to the College of Complexes during the speeches is one is one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Never, never. And uh, that means I can't call Charlie a schmuck. <laughs> but he and, can ask stupid questions. Well, you. you All right, move on. Are, let's move on. <laughs> All right, uh, who's got an announcement? I always know Charlie does, and I know he's going to want to get into the screen sharing part of it. So I'm uh, getting it ready now when he's ready to start with the schedule. So Charlie, go right ahead and uh, start uh, what your announcements are. Okay, for you who's not aware of this, these are events around town or on the internet. Okay, uh, the Illinois Green Party is running a series of programs explaining each one is dedicated to one of their 10 key values. And that's every Friday. If I, by the way, if you want any further information on any of these events, my email and Facebook info are located on the main website of the College of Complexes on Facebook and on the webpage. Anyhow, every Friday at, at five o'clock Central Time, there's panel discussions on the 10 key values. And since I know some of you could use the, some values in your life, you might want to uh, consider attending. Another thing, this is nationwide. There'll be a public transit conference. These are, and they specifically, the professionals specifically invite the public, but it's a fun conference that's on Sunday, the 31st of January on all day long um, uh, discussions of public transit uh, advocates and enthusiasts. Um, on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, from seven to nine, the Democratic Socialists of America are gonna be covering uh, labor issues. Uh, that's on Tuesday. If you want, now they got a new thing out there. I'm one of the organizers of this, but uh, there's something out there called a solidarity economy, which is really mm -hmm. eco-socialism. But if you'd like, we're trying to get, I'm trying to get them to come to the college, but nevertheless, on the 30th at three o'clock, there'll be a program on the solidarity economy, as opposed to capitalist ex economy based on exploitation. Uh, the Industrial Workers of the World, Chicago branch, the Haymarket branch, uh, will be meeting next Sunday, one o'clock. You gotta know the password. But I might let you know. You can be my. Uh, you can be my guest if you wish to attend. Uh, very importantly, the Jane Adams Senior Caucus will be having their monthly meeting on on Thursday. We seniors want all everything for free, so join the Jane Adams. By the way, there's uh, scams. Warnings are going out there. There's scams floating around about this vaccination. I just posted it, got something from the congressman. Uh, be careful, they're taking advantage of people and saying if you send us some money, we'll put you on a waiting list or whatever. So be careful of any scams regarding the vaccine. Now, although I am not a capitalist, 
I will give an advertisement for the College of Complexes. And our next street. open dates, our next open dates, uh, what's that, Tim? I'm gonna share screen on the schedule. Oh, all right, good. Our next open dates, uh, if you care to speak, are March or February 20th and 20th, we'll, we'll get out of that. All right, let's, let's go with next week. Next week, we're gonna hear from, go down, scroll up a little bit, Tim. Scroll up a little bit more, right, nope, right there. There, yeah, okay. Next week, a group that I personally have been affiliated with for many years, the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee will explain how you should, it's tax season is starting, and I thought it would be poignant, don't pay any war tax. Um, one of our regular members, Kay Myers, uh, stop paying taxes altogether. And I think the IRS, she didn't want to pay war tax. I think they just didn't bother with her. They, they gave up and let her get away. She didn't pay uh, there's so few people at the IRS, maybe in a year or two, they'll, find, they'll get uh, up there's with enough her. Of them. They just gave up on her and she didn't pay more. Anyhow, <laughs> on the 23rd, scroll up, Tim. Uh, we're going to have an author talk about economics. Let the uh, economics. This should be a very good program. She's an academic out of Virginia, I believe, but she's got a book out, uh, Core Principles of Economics. So that should be a good one. And the following week, uh, we have a, a philosopher, my friend Mike. Uh, he's going to be talking about how we're using computers too much, or they've taken over our lives. They haven't, they haven't taken over my life, but maybe your life, they, they have. On the following week, um, and, and okay, go to the next month. That was February 6th. All right. This is all about interpreting the Constitution. This is a speaker from our, our other campus who's joining us. And he's going to talk about how you interpret the Constitution, which I, I must say, from what I heard, a lot of you could benefit by this program. And on the following week, uh, we're going to be talking about how, how some, some people are sabotaging America. And it's an inside job. But they're sabotaging America. Okay. Yeah, the, Democrats, is that what he's going to say? Well, you got to come and find out. All right. The next open dates, if you'd care to speak, are February 20th and 27th. We also have four dates open in March. We also have a brand new Google group. If you go to the website right at the top, it tells you how to join or contact me, and I will add your email to the list. By the way, this past Tuesday, the College Complexes celebrated its 70th, that's 70 anniversary. The first meeting of the College of Complexes was on January 6, 1951. So there's been a lot of good stuff talked about at the college, and we hope you join us at upcoming events. Sir, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I want to now formally introduce David Swanson, an executive director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator for Roots Action. World Beyond War is a global nonviolent movement to end war and establish a just and sustainable peace. Their organization's goals are to create awareness of popular support for ending war and to further develop that to support. They will work and advance the idea of not just preventing any particular war, but in abolishing the entire institution. They will strive to replace the culture of war with one of peace in which nonviolent means of conflict resolution take the place of bloodshed. World Beyond War was begun with was begun on January 1st, 2014. They have chapters and affiliates around the world. They are building something truly 
International, connecting people and organizations, and adding support of anti-war endeavors all of all kinds around the world. This is a global campaign of education, lobbying, and nonviolent action. Let's uh, give it up for uh, David Swanson. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Stand Charles. Boy, thank Dave. And uh, like they said, the reminder during the presentation to mute yourself so we can hear John clearly. Uh, by John, perhaps meaning David. Um, David, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Not a problem. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope you all can hear me. Um, I, I like to ask people when I start talking about ending war, uh, what they think uh, before my presentation, and then again, maybe at the end. Uh, and I, I can see maybe two thirds of you. So if I give, I want to give you all two choices uh, to say which group you're in. And I think if you ra physically raise your hand, that'll work. But if you all also have the, the little raise hand button, uh, maybe that will work, including for some of the people who are not on video. Um, so the two choices are, I believe no war is ever justifiable, is ever defensible, is ever the right thing to do, the best choice, the, the moral decision to make. Uh, second category, you, you don't have to vote yet until you hear the two choices. Uh, second category, second possibility, I think some sides of some wars sometimes can be justified, can be defendable in, in argument, can, can be the right and proper thing to do. Uh, so, so who's in the first group? Uh, war is never justified. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a uh, bunch of unknowns. Okay, and who's in the second group? Sometimes justified. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, unless that was already there. Take your hand and take your, you know, raise hand button down if you're not raising it anymore. Two participants okay, so, raised their hand. Okay, so it's looking to me like the, like the war is never justified group. Uh, which I'm in and is correct, you're right, you win, uh, is in the majority, uh, but not a, not a huge majority. There's a good number of people here who are not in that group yet. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's worth noting that this is not representative of the US public. Uh, in the general US public, the, the second group uh, is in the overwhelming majority. Uh, us, you know, we're, we're in a very small minority of freaks and weirdos who who think that uh, mass murder operations are never justifiable. Uh, and so I want to try to talk about why that's not really so freakish and weird and ought to be uh, perhaps taken a little bit seriously. Uh, and I'm going to share screen and, and show you all a PowerPoint uh, and uh, make sure it's uh, significantly less than an hour. And then maybe we can have a good conversation and discussion and debate. Um, uh, and I will, for those of you who are in the choir, I'm preaching to uh, a, a good bit. Uh, second half of the of my presentation will be what we can do about it. Uh, um, but I also encourage you to take my PowerPoint if you want it, or take any points that are in it, and do your own presentation to everyone you can reach. Um, because it's not enough to just agree with me. You got to get ten other people <laughs> to agree with me. Uh, and, and those of you who are not yet on board with total abolition of war, uh, please keep an open mind. Please consider what I'm going to show and say. And please consider the extent to which we probably do agree. Right? If you want to move five cents out of the military budget and put it into dealing with pandemics or climate collapse or people who are hungry, we agree five cents worth. You know, you want to get up to it trillion and a quarter dollars, we'll agree that much more. But somewhere in between 50 billion, then we, we have a 50 billion agreement, right? So uh, it, it, nobody, nobody thinks we're going to abolish all militaries on earth by Wednesday. The question is, are we going to move in that direction or are we going to keep moving in the opposite direction? Um, so let me, let me share screen and let's see, I want this and this and play from start. Can you all see uh, my PowerPoint? Yes. All right, I'm gonna 
hit the little button to go to the next screen and it does not work. That's terrific. No, your space bar would do it probably. Are you want a Mac? It will not do it. Let me see if maybe I have to share screen a different way somehow. Your PowerPoint should work either Let's way. See if I share the whole desktop. Let me push this little button here. Ah, there we go. So this is my technical difficulties message. After having technical difficulties, uh, I can't see you in order to determine whether anyone uh, gets the joke, but it's not much I of a joke. joke. <laughs> it's, it's not much of a joke, really. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit serious. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Is there anyone who can't see uh, who, for whom I need to make sure to say everything out loud? I think we can all share screen. If they can see the Zoom, they can, can see all, us. You can all see. Okay, great. Um, so I, I, I just want to point out that that those of you in the United States and I myself here in the United States are in a, a very unusual place, a, a very non-typical bit of the world uh, that engages in far more militarism and military activity and weapons dealing and, and coup instigating and war uh, waging than any other entity on earth. Um, you know, on the same day as this coup attempt uh, at the US Capitol, uh, the, the woman, uh, former, you know, former foreign policy advisor to Dick Cheney, who, who was, a key facilitator of the coup in Ukraine several years back and wants a coup in Russia uh, was put forward as a possible undersecretary of state by the president elect. Um, foreign military bases pretty much means US foreign military bases. Uh, other countries have a handful. This is not normal to have, you know, thanks for watching the sporting event from 175 countries. That's not normal. Nobody else thanks their beloved troops for watching their sporting events from 175 countries or even two or three. Um, half, half of the world's military spending very roughly is US military spending. And another huge chunk is US allies and most is US weapons customers. Uh, you know, the, the regions of the world uh, that are war-torn uh, manufacture virtually no weapons. Uh, the weapons are, are shipped in from outside, uh, like, the, like the alcohol for the Native Americans, like the opium for the Chinese. The weapons come from somewhere, and pr first and foremost, from the United States. Uh, the U.S. sells or gives weapons to or trains or funds uh, or two or three of those things, uh, the military of this percent of the most oppressive governments on earth by the U.S. government's own definition. What do you think is the right answer there? And you're, well, you you're probably, probably say all, about 12%. You're, you're probably all muted and that's good. We, we, that's good, good uh, etiquette on, on Zoom calls, uh, but I will give you the the answer. It is ninety six percent. If you take the if you take the fifty most oppressive dictatorships and and other governments on earth by the U.S. government's own understanding, uh, forty eight of them are uh, almost all of them armed uh, and, and all of them armed and or trained and or funded by the U.S. That the two exceptions out of those fifty are North Korea and Cuba. So when Donald Trump talks to the leader of North Korea and everyone freaks out that he would talk to uh, the leader of an oppressive government, you know, that's not the normal US government relationship to brutal governments around the world. The normal relationship is to arm them and fund them and train them. Um, with regard to this coup and joking about, you know, the coup finally happening in a country without a US embassy, let's not be sucked into cheering for the anti-coup militarism and rushing to figure out faster ways to get more National Guard's troops on the streets and, and have, a, have a domestic war on terror and more uh, you know, anti-civil liberties legislation and so forth. Uh, you know, this, this was not a situation where we needed more military on the streets, uh, and there are not likely to be 
more situations uh, where we need more military on the streets. Uh, there are any number of things listed here that could have been done uh, more wisely. Um, and uh, if, if the United States Congress for the first time in you know, living memory uh, uses impeachment for something legitimate, you know, not for warmongering, not for sex scandals, you know, but for what some of us have been demanding for over four years, you know, this is, this is one of those first he instigated violence against the immigrants, but Congress didn't care because Congress isn't immigrants. Then he instigated violence against the blacks and the women and the media and the leftists. And, you know, finally the violence hits Congress and it's time to impeach. Uh, it's better late than never, right? This, this, is, this actually could restore uh, some respectability to the impeachment process and set a precedent for future office holders. Um, and, and I think show that something nonviolent, uh, the rule of law can be used, uh, not just the rule of force. Um, so we, we did this poll, you think war is never ever justified, or you think some wars are sometimes justified by some participants. Um, if you're in that second group, if you said that some wars are sometimes justified, can somebody who's not muted think of and name one such war and shout it out? World War II against Adolf Hitler. Now comes the magic trick. How did I know that the answer was going to be World War II other than my magical powers? It's because any human being in the United States that you ask that question of you have a 99.999% chance they're going to say World War II. It is the top subject of U.S. entertainment, U.S. Uh, nonfiction history. Uh, it, it is the is the origin myths uh, of the of the U.S. Republic of the past. 75 years, uh, it, it, we are saturated with the story of World War II, uh, a historical story, but much of what we're saturated with isn't historical, it's made up. Uh, but, it's, but it's very interesting to me that the single biggest public works program of the United States, the thing that the US government spends the most money on, the 60% of the federal discretionary budget goes into war, and when you ask anybody to justify it, to find an example of it that's justifiable, the most recent one that anybody goes to, and the one that 99.999% of people go to, is from 75 years ago. You know, we don't go back 75 years ago to, to find a, you know, a justifiable example of, of something we spend $5 on. But when it's a trillion and a quarter dollars a year, hey, <laughs> you know, we're, we're it's okay to go back to the 1940s, which we don't go back to for anything else uh, for World War II. And why World War II? If, I, if, if someone who's unmuted uh, and, and can tell me why it is that's, that World War II is the one. Hitler. <laughs> Hitler. Pearl Harbor. Hitler and Pearl Harbor. Okay, so let's talk about Hitler and Pearl Harbor and other elements of World War II. Uh, this is the table of contents. This is part of it and the rest of it's on the next slide of a, of a book I wrote this past year called Leaving World War II Behind. I'm not gonna tell you the whole book, but I'll tell you the you know, bits and pieces of the table of contents. Um, World War II uh, was not fought to save anybody from Hitler. Or it was, it was certainly not fought to save anyone from death camps. Uh, there were major public meetings, uh, you know, news story of the month over and over again, where the governments of the world refused to accept the Jews. That the, 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 not, the, the Nazi lunacy for years was to expel them all. It eventually evolved into kill them all. But during the time period when it was expel them all, uh, nobody would take them. 
the U.S. government wouldn't take them, nobody else would take them, and for shamelessly, openly, publicly anti-Semitic reasons, you know, we don't want them. Uh, and even right through the course of the war, with peace activists going to the State Department and going to the Foreign Secretary in the in the UK and, and saying, take them out, uh, they would be told, no, we have no interest in that, we can't be bothered, we're busy with the war. And privately, the discussions within the U.S. State Department would be, if if we if we did that, uh, Hitler would say yes, and that would be an embarrassment and an inconvenience because nobody wants them. So this so this you know the 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 evil of Hitler, at least in the sense of of what the Nazis did to Jews and gays and and the handicapped and and. Uh, leftists and communists and others uh, in these insane death camps, uh, you know, that, that, that has some sort of motivation for World War II was invented after World War II. There were, there were no, uh, you know, Uncle Sam wants you to save the Jews posters. Uh, there, there never were. Um, World War II, you know, it, it, it's not something that had to happen. Uh, for a number of reasons discussed in the in the subsequent chapters, but including that the, the insanity of World War One and the insane method of ending World War One, which had smart people predicting World War Two on the spot. Uh, there were decades during which uh, dumb policies could have been changed uh, to make World War Two far less likely. Um, the U.S. didn't have to develop and promote the dangerous bunk science of eugenics, didn't have to develop the theory of the Nordic race and so forth, which was you know, principally a U.S. creation. The U.S. did not have to develop the practice of racist segregation. You had the Nazis coming over to study the segregation laws you know, with the New York Bar Association with protesters outside. Uh, you had, uh, the U.S. did not have to develop the practices of genocide, of ethnic cleansing, of concentrating people on reservations. You know, Hit Hitler explicitly wanted to reproduce the westward movement of the United States moving east, you know, go east, young man, uh, the wild east. You know, this was, this was the inspiration. Uh, the United States did not have to fund and arm the Nazis. You know, principal figures within the the Nazis uh, state unequivocally that without the support of U.S. corporations, they never could have waged this war. Uh, the U.S. did not have to prioritize opposing the Soviet Union. Uh, ne neither did other Western nations. So I'm just focusing on the United States in this book. Uh, the United States did not have to develop the Pledge of Allegiance and the one arm salute. Uh, not that this was a major contribution to the evils of Nazism, but it's, it's a contribution to the current evils of this country. Uh, the United States welcomed Nazis into the US military. I, I mean, this is strange to have this war of light against darkness and good against evil, and then to take 1600 of the, of the evil and, and put them into the US military so that the, the, the you know, the caves under the mountains uh, in, in Virginia and West Virginia and Maryland, Pennsylvania for the US government, these were, you know, created by former Nazis as duplicates of, of Nazi underground bunkers the the weapons that destroyed vietnam you know were developed by by former nazis and the, the major you know cold war creating propaganda of the cold war developed by uh former nazis um the united states did not have to engage in an arms race with japan uh you know there's there's endless disputes over exactly who knew what at what moment uh in terms of of Pearl Harbor and, and Pearl Harbor as a shorthand for the Philippines and then, uh, you know, eight other places that were uh, attacked, some of them with much more significant damage and suffering than Pearl Harbor. But uh, this was this was a war that that people were protesting in the streets of the United States for for many years as a build up to it. Uh, it, it was no, this was no surprise uh, to anyone. I mean, the United States government had, you know, a list of steps for what could be done to provoke Japan to attack first and, and took them and checked them off. Uh, World War II does not prove that violence 
is needed for defense. This is, you know, this is a, a tough point, and I'll be talking further about this point, but uh, people have a very hard time recognizing how much more powerful nonviolent movements against, against invasions, against coups, against tyranny domestically have been. But in the past century, movements that have been principally nonviolent have succeeded at over twice the percentage rate of those that have been principally violent. Even, even against the Nazis in the time of World War II, when the science of nonviolent activism was in its you know, infancy, if that, uh, the, the successes uh, were uh, uh, amazing and could have easily been, been built on and carried farther. Uh, World War II was the worst thing that humanity has done to itself and to the earth environmentally in any short period of time, the most death, suffering, destruction, precedence established. Um, but in our culture, it's an incredible set of myths, myths justifying uh, nuclear bombings, uh, myths uh, about motivations, myths about who played what role, the notion that the United States, uh, you know, was a major factor in, uh, in a war that was you know, overwhelmingly won by the Soviet Union, uh, and, and so on. Um, there, there was a tremendous amount of resistance uh, by peace advocates uh, and war resistors to the to World War II in the United States, and I tell some of those stories. Um, I, 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 I throw in taxes just for fun because, it, as you may have heard, there are people in the United States who are not big fans of taxes, uh, and yet they are big fans of World War II, but they don't know where the heck do people think taxes came from? You know, ordinary people were not significantly taxed until World War II, and it was supposed to be for World War II and then end. It just didn't end. Uh, and so I think people resent taxes because you don't get anything for them, which is principally because all the money goes into uh, goes into wars, uh, and because billionaires pay at a lower rate than their secretaries. I mean, there are lots of reasons people resent taxes, but one of them, I think, is you know this faint memory of the fact that they were supposed to be temporary. Um, and, and as I said, in, in terms of the oddity of World War II being the defense of you know of, of next year's military budget. Uh, conquest, uh, uh, colonialism, uh, the absence of international structures of, of law, the, the whole world of the 1940s, uh, you know, is almost, is dissimilar in almost every relevant way to the world we live in. Uh, and so despite every tin pot dictator of the past 75 years in, in the sights of the U.S. military being called the new Hitler, uh, you know, even Hitler wasn't the Hitler uh, in, in terms of, of our cultural understanding of, of the threat and, the, and FDR's lies about the threat to, to the Americas and so forth. Um, so here, here's another question I like to ask people. It's a little bit of a trick question, but I'm just gonna spit out the answer. What is the deadliest weapon? What weapon has killed the most in wars? And it is of course- Nuclear. Yeah, not not even close. Not even if not even if it wasn't a trick question, uh, right? I mean, the nuclear bombs have been have been uh, used twice. Nuclear testing and storage and transport and disasters uh, have have killed many more. Uh, Disease. There have, there have been many many near misses and accidents with nukes, but the the, the trick answer uh, is is the budget. And the reason I say the budget is, you know, one example is on this billboard in Milwaukee that we put up uh, last year, 3% of just U.S. military spending could end starvation on Earth, right? A little over 1% of just U.S. military spending could end the lack of clean drinking water on Earth. You start getting into 5, 10, 20% of U.S. military spending, or, you know, there was this big push last summer to move 10% into addressing disease pandemics and other useful projects. And it, you know, polls showed overwhelming US public support for it and the Congress overwhelmingly voted it down. But you start talking about those kind of numbers and you're talking about you know, 
a Green New Deal beyond the wildest dreams of the advocates of a Green New Deal, right? This is the kind of money we're talking about. And so when people say, well, I'm against all the wars, but I want the institution, I want the military, I want, I want this institution because I imagine it prevents wars, even though the record, of course, and even Eisenhower knew this and it's been just documented over and over and over again since, uh, is that the more military spending, the more wars the more bases, the more wars near those bases and so forth. Uh, it, people who say, I want, I want the spending, I want the institution, but I don't want the wars, not only are doing what it takes to get the wars, but have got, have got the wrong idea of which does the more damage, of which kills the more people. Because just the budgets, just the diversion of the resources from useful projects kills far more people, causes far more suffering than all the wars put together. Thus far, I will grant you that a single so-called small nuclear war would outdo the damage of everything in human history. Uh, but I'm talking about what's happened so far, not what is ever more, ever more uh, in, in, at risk of happening. Um, so, you know, we have, this, we have this stuff in Western culture that many parts of the globe have never heard of uh, called just war theory. Uh, and it comes out of ancient and medieval uh, Catholic, you know, it comes out of people whose worldview is almost incomprehensible in most ways to us. People who were not justifying defensive wars, people who thought defense was not justifiable, people who thought if someone had the goodness to try to kill you, you should get out of their way and let them because they were sending you to a far better place, right? People who, whose thinking is very hard for us to understand, but we still drag into the 21st century, you know, this stuff called just war theory because it makes such great rhetoric. It, there's these meaningless phrases about proportionality and so forth that, that get thrown into newspaper articles about new wars and, and, and ongoing wars. And uh, so I looked at all these criteria in, a, in another book I wrote uh, called War is Never Just, uh, and, and some of them are just not measurable. You know, you, you, can't, you can't go out and, and measure whether something is proportional or not. The US military says we can, we can bomb a building where ISIS has cash stored if it kills no more than 49 people. Well, they could have said two people. They could have said three million people. They just invent the number out of thin air. Uh, some, of the, some of them are impossible, right? How do you, uh, enemy soldiers should be respected, right? Now, of the million ways I could imagine someone respecting me, not a single one of them includes murdering me. Not a single one. Uh, some of them are just amoral, are just irrelevant. You know, the, the war must be waged by a legitimate authority. A lot, a lot of people in the United States think if a war is waged by Congress rather than the president, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good legitimate authority. Only the Congress has the right to commit a crime. Uh, you know, but if, if Canada, you know, sent a couple missiles to Chicago, uh, you know, raise your hand if your first concern would be whether the prime minister or the parliament did it. You know, frankly, I, I, I just wouldn't be able to bring myself to care. Um, and, and there isn't, you know, there isn't a, 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 an exception to, to, to criminal law for legislatures. There just isn't. Um, but so if, if there could be a war next week or next year that miraculously met all these criteria, did more good than harm, you know, it would also have to outweigh all the damage of keeping the institution of war around for the past you know several decades waiting waiting for a just war to appear and all the damage of all the patently unjust wars that happened in, you know in the interim so it, it, you know you can't you can't come up with a theoretical war that's that's justifiable um, but here's 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 why the world the, the the organization that I work for World Beyond War goes after the whole institution of war, not just a particular war or a particular weapon or a particular atrocity. It's because we need two trillion dollars a year in global military spending for other things. Desperately, we need it. Desperately to to try to save the habitability of the planet, uh, to try to address disease epidemics to try to, to to address incredible suffering and uh, and homelessness and you know we have the biggest 
uh, crises of, of refugees uh, ever in the world. Uh, war is a huge destroyer of the natural environment. Uh, and because of the power of the military in our, in our government, in our culture, you know, it, it gets a pass. You know, military pollution is a huge percentage of climate pollution, but it's excluded from Kyoto Agreement and similar agreements. That needs to change. Uh, war, war erodes liberties. Every, every war, doesn't matter how many people scream freedom, we have fewer freedoms. Uh, you know, not just the people living under the bombs have fewer freedoms, but the people who, whose government is launches dropping the bombs thousands of miles away have fewer freedoms at the end. War promotes bigotry. I mean, this is documented historically, the, the, the big outbreaks of, of hateful, racist violence in the United States come during and after big wars. Uh, and, and it's a vicious cycle. Uh, the bigotry helps, helps the propaganda for wars. The wars help uh, the propaganda for bigotry. Um, war endangers us. This is, this is another one that you know, we have to you know, talk about and people may have questions about. Um, I, hope you're, I hope you're writing down all the things I'm getting disastrously wrong to, to question me about uh, shortly. But uh, it, it's not just the, the dozens of top U.S. officials, the, you know, the, the week after they retire, who say this is counterproductive, what we've been doing. We're generating more enemies. Uh, I mean, it's, it's CIA reports that say their drone, uh, their drone wars are generating more enemies than they're killing, that it's counterproductive. Uh, it's, it's, you know, studies of, of terrorism that, that show that global terrorism increasing predictably during a war on terrorism. Uh, it, it's, you know, and, and it's the, the fact that you get, you've got the most violence and the most terrorism precisely in the countries that have been liberated in the war on terrorism. Um, war impoverishes us. This is, you know, the, if, if war were, you know, if war were not such a moral atrocity, it wouldn't be so offensive to see Congress members declaring war to be a jobs program, uh, but it would still be false. It would still be incorrect. You know, militarism is not a jobs program. You have fewer jobs for every dollar you spend on the military than you had before. And, 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 and this is a tricky one for people to grasp because everybody knows their neighbors work for the subcontractor of the contractor for the military and their uncles in the military. You know, but the, the economists are, are, are in universal agreement. You spend the same money on education or infrastructure or green energy, and you get more jobs and better paying jobs. You even don't tax those dollars from working people in the first place and you get more jobs, right? So, so the, these jobs are a mirage. There are military jobs everywhere. I'm not pretending they don't exist. I haven't lost my mind, but military spending reduces the number of jobs. Uh, this, is, you know, this is maybe a key point, but gets lost in all the other you know, ocean of, of reasons why we need to abolish war. War is immoral. War is mass murder on a large enough scale uh, and against, the, against people uh, who have been dehumanized sufficiently uh, that we let it happen. So we have to go after the whole institution. Um, you know, here's some of the some of the financial trade-offs. This was a comparison that that I can uh, made with with nuclear weapons. Here, if there's one that I made, just uh, taking global military spending uh, as a whole, uh, it, it's it's almost unfathomable. And people and people who say bring the bring the war dollars home, we need to take care of Americans, <laughs> you know, is is very unnecessarily self-centered, right? I mean, military spending is such an unfathomable pile of money. You could transform the lives of everyone in this little 4% of humanity and the other 96%. It's not either or. Um, this, this is why it's immoral. It is one-sided slaughters of men, women, children, and infants. Uh, there's these are some other questions I usually ask and everybody gets wrong, but I go ahead and just give the answers here. What percentage of deaths in the U.S. war in Iraq since 2003 were U.S. troops? People, you know, people in the United States usually say 50 percent or more, uh, no more than a half a percent. If if 2.2 million people die of coronavirus in the United States, which I hope will not be the case, uh, that'll be 0.6 percent. Uh, that compares to 
5% of the people of Iraq killed by violence in excess of the already high death rates uh, in 2003, uh, or 0.3% of the US population killed in World War II. How many of the five permanent members uh, of the UN Security Council are among the top six weapons dealing nations on earth? So this is the, the, the global institution established to rid the world of the scourge of war that gave special powers to five big countries that they could set the agenda, veto anything, et cetera. What do you think the answer is here? I would say all five. Now, all, yeah, five. You, all five, yeah. You all, now see what? people start catching on to how all my polls work. It's always the worst answer. Yes, five. I, it, five of the top six. The reason I put it that way is because Germany is, is, you know, Germany is a top weapons dealer, but it's not, it's not a permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, what about this one? Humans just can't be rid of war. Like, Poverty is always with us. War is always with us. Doesn't matter whether or not it's justifiable. Doesn't matter whether I can present an argument to, to justify a war. We just, we just you know, for some reason, it's in our DNA or our economy or our, you know, we just can't get rid of it or we're stuck with it. People, people will say this, but if, if war were inevitable, would it need a billion dollar marketing division just in this country? Would it? Um, things that used to be inevitable, right? Inevitable just being a nonsense defense for things that you can't morally defend, but you want to keep around, or you just want to give up the struggle to get rid of them. You know, th th this, is, this is what was said about slavery, what was said about uh, capital punishment, what was said about uh, an all male electorate, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think war is inevitable. It was absent from most of human prehistory. It's been very sporadic since its creation. People will say there's always a war somewhere and there's always not a war, many, many, many somewhere. Uh, it's been unknown to many societies. There have been societies that couldn't even comprehend it. People questioned by anthropologists, why wouldn't you use violence and, and, and almost unable to, to understand the idea of, of murder people who've grown up without seeing cartoon characters commit murder 35 times an hour or whatever. Uh, war has been unlike its current form until virtually this moment, right? I mean, the war fought by kids in trailers in Nevada, it, you know, is, is so radically different from, you know, the U.S. Civil War that it's very strange to be talking about it even as the same thing. Um, war is avoided by almost everybody who can avoid it. Uh, even... Uh, you know, you, you've got a huge percentage, you know, 40% in this country and big and bigger in some other countries and much smaller in a lot of countries of people who will say, I would fight in a war. But what's stopping them? You know, I mean, to, to, to the, can they not find the recruitment stations? Um, people will avoid it if they can. Uh, and almost everybody who takes part in it, even from a distance, even in a minor way, suffers as a result. Here's, here's the number of recorded cases of, of PTSD, of post-traumatic stress disorder, of brain injury, of moral injury, of loss of limb, of suicidal tendencies as a result of war deprivation. Not a single person found anywhere on this planet. You, you people seem to survive okay without it. Uh, percentage of humanity whose governments spend a fraction of what the US government does on war. 96% of humanity. Human nature does not exist. Uh, we can have a long conversation about this. I don't want it to take us too far off subject. Uh, I can send you some books by Jean-Paul Sartre if you want. But m my point is that when people want to defend something and can't figure out a way to do it, they'll just declare it human nature, right? But there's, you know, there's no... Uh, there, there's, there's no, you know, scientific investigation of, of human nature. It's not something you can, you can find and identify. It's, it's a phrase, it's a linguistic phrase that's an excuse. Uh, it's used to excuse things. Uh, don't tell me war is human nature. Tell me why we should have war, why I should allow it to continue. Um, 
but even U.S. nature. I mean, it's it's so common for for pundits and politicians in the United States to treat four percent of humanity as human nature, right? So we have all these studies of whether universal health care could possibly work in theory. Never mind that it works in reality, you know, in dozens of other parts of the planet. That doesn't matter, you know. So, but even U.S. nature. Uh, is far better than is, is often thought uh, and is completely alterable. Um, US, U.S. public opinion is, you know, is, is far better than, uh, than what you think of from the U.S. media. The U.S. Uh, media does not serve the U.S. public. The U.S. government does not serve the U.S. public. Um, so there, there are reasons to imagine uh, that that's, that there that there's a desire for peace, uh, even in the world's biggest war maker. Countries with no standing army, small to tiny countries, but a growing list. Number of countries with military spending closer to the US amount than to those countries without any military spending. None, not a one. We, we also sometimes get distracted from, from working toward the end of war uh, by being told something else has to happen first. If you're going to have capitalism, you're going to have war. Deal with it. Stop, stop trying to, to prevent wars. Stop ending wars. Stop blocking weapon sales. We have, to, we have to focus entirely on ending capitalism. Well, I'm not going to tell you which noble and justifiable campaign is most likely to succeed first. I will Tell you that if they all work together, we'll, they'll all succeed uh, more rapidly. Uh, but you don't have to. There's not some law of physics that says you have to first end racism and then you can end war. But I do think we're far more likely to end them both together than separately. If war were necessary, couldn't it be launched without lies? The, the, the big justifiable war, World War II, why did FDR have to you know, have to tell all the usual lies to get it started. Uh, is that justifiable? And is it more defensible than democracy, for example? Does it outweigh that? Um, Nonviolence denial is as dangerous as climate denial. Right, here's a list of some places where nonviolent movements prevented coups. Uh, you know, refusing to recognize the power of nonviolence, uh, that resorting to nonviolence is resorting to the most powerful tool available, uh, is a very dangerous denial in our culture, uh, as dangerous as climate denial. Here's, here's a quiz. I, I know you're all muted, but I'll, I'll read it and give you the answer. What, what tends to be present where wars are begun? Resource scarcity? Human rights violations in need of a response from a noble savior from afar. Raw fossil fuels. You know, you know how this works now, right? Raw fossil fuels is the one and only correct answer there. If war is beneficial, why are its victims so ungrateful? Why do people in the majority of countries on earth tell US and international polling companies that the biggest threat to peace in the world is the US government? if the US government is waging its wars for the benefit of the world, if it's serving as a global policeman, as an as a act of philanthropy, why do, why do the people in the countries attacked uh, hate it so much? And why do people in other countries fear it and resent it so much? So I want to agree to disagree with with everybody who has World War II in their mind. I can't, you know, I can't counter decades of saturation propaganda in, in 30 minutes, but I can agree with anyone who says they don't want World War III, that any war moving forward is not defensible, right? I don't care what you think of the US Civil War, how much glory you want to attach to it, how little you care that so many countries ended slavery without a, a bloody civil war, uh, that this was a global movement that ended slavery in a variety of violent and nonviolent ways. Uh, I, I just care if we decide to end mass incarceration, 
do we first pick out some fields and shoot millions of young people and then pass some legislation to end mass incarceration? Or option B, we just jump straight to passing some legislation to end mass incarceration, right? I think, I think no matter what we all think we're supposed to believe about the US Civil War, we actually all have outgrown it in that sense. We don't see the relevance of picking out some fields and murdering a bunch of people first and then you know, ending fossil fuel consumption or whatever. Um, so if you can't imagine a justifiable war going forward, uh, if you can't imagine that the risk of nuclear apocalypse uh, doesn't demand that we start eliminating the, the military stockpiles and the military planning, uh, you know, if we can agree on the future, who cares about the past? Uh, we're, we're, you know, this is, this is the most popular just war theory criterion. War is a last resort. But if war is a last resort, why do we never hear about any first resorts or second or third? You know, when they, they, there have been polls done of the U.S. public. Do you think such and such a war, and it's, you know, it's made up fictional war. Do you think such and such a war uh, is justified? And you get a certain level of, of response, right, of support. And then the question, do you think it's justified knowing that there are not are peaceful alternatives to it. And then the third group is asked, do you think this war is justified uh, knowing that there are no alternatives to it, that everything else has been tried? And the weird thing is that that third group gets the exact same level of support of the first group. People just imagine that because they aren't, you know, <laughs> insane sociopaths, neither is their government. A and it never would even consider launching a war without trying everything else first. You know, the, <laughs> the history of every actual war, uh, you know, on earth notwithstanding. Uh, so, but of course, if you tell people there are alternatives, then the, then the support plummets. Um, peace actually has to be carefully avoided. This is the actual history of every war. You can write down your favorite wars. Uh, and when we get to the questions and answers shortly, you can ask me, but I mean, these are all wars listed here. And there are many, many more where peace was, peace was available and, and carefully avoided. On the other hand, it's also true that peace has to be carefully constructed, that unless we change the systems and the structures and the financing and the corruption and the motivations and the communications, unless we move into a reverse arms race rather than escalating the current arms races, uh, we're not gonna get peace. Unless we work on building law and democracy and diplomacy and cooperation and, and, and skills of unarmed peacekeeping and a culture of peace, uh, we're going to keep getting wars. Um, what can we do? This is just sort of an overview of, of things that we need to be working toward in a variety of ways. I'm going to go quickly so I can get to some more specific things we can do. Um, one, one topic we should be thinking about is the U.S. budget and the fact that Senator Sanders uh, this week became the, the soon-to-be chair of the Senate Budget Committee. The fact that Congress members Lee and Pocan uh, are setting up a military spending reduction caucus. Uh, what are we going to be able to make that mean and how much work are we going to want to put into getting members to join it? Uh, the, the chair of the progressive caucus uh, is on board with moving money from militarism to, to human and environmental needs. Uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, I list here some of the, some of the members that are on board, but most are not. Um, so this is, you know, this is a work in progress. Uh, I think the Green New Deal is, is even more likely to go somewhere than just the critical act of moving money out of militarism and into useful things. Uh, I think moving money out of militarism is the best hope for a serious Green New Deal, and a serious Green New Deal is the best hope for demilitarization. Um, and, and we can work on this, and as we work on it, 
organize and educate, uh, pass local resolutions on this and organize and educate in the process, uh, build global and international uh, campaigns around this and make connections and organize and educate. Um, you know, this is, this is what we have to do. Uh, divestment campaigns are taking off and, and in particular around nuclear weapons will be taking off dramatically uh, in the months ahead. And, uh, you know, this is something that World Beyond War and other groups have been succeeding at getting your local city, your local university, et cetera, to take money out of out of weapons. Uh, why can't it be shameful as it used to be, uh, even right before World War II, to be profiting from blood? Uh, you know, why should a school teacher who's worked hard and done good have to have their retirement depend on there being more wars? Uh, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and, and again, these are campaigns that can organize people and educate people for bigger things. Um, demilitarizing police. This is something else we're having successes at in various cities and localities, and that helps unite a couple of movements uh, together. Um, we've also been having, you know, and we can talk about all the successes the peace movement has preventing wars, uh, ending wars, etc., cetera, um, because people are, you know, have the doom and gloom so prominent before them from the from the communication system our country has but recent minor victories include stopping some of the worst uh nominations for cabinet positions going forward and there are many more to be working on uh in the weeks ahead uh, on the topic of war powers, uh, you know, we've just we've just been through the first president, uh, you know, since Eisenhower to denounce, uh, you know, anyone who helps the military industrial complex, while also being the first president to shamelessly brag about selling masses of weapons to brutal dictatorships and, and so forth. Similarly, the first, the first president under whom the US Congress have finally got around to using the war powers resolution of 73 and end a war, um, but he vetoes it. Uh, and, and at the same time, the first president in a long time not to have started a major new war. So, you know, all kinds of contradictions, but on the critical question of war powers, you, you've both just had Congress end a war, have it vetoed and commit to, to ending it again. So we got to make that happen immediately. But you also have had Congress now, in, in, including in this bill just passed, uh, take on the power to prevent a president from ending wars, you know, denying presidents the power to withdraw troops from Afghanistan as well, by the way, as Korea and Germany. And this... Sanity has to be has to be undone. Um, things that a uh, things that a Joe Biden compelled to listen to us could do instantly: end wars in Yemen, Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, uh, end weapon sales to particular countries. Saudi and UAE are going to be on the agenda very soon, or everywhere. Um, rejoin the Paris Agreement. Get military climate damage uh, included in. Uh, in all of these agreements, make college into public education. Yes, there is a way for a president alone to do this. And, and yes, this is the biggest enemy in the eyes of the, of the Pentagon. It's not China, it's not uh, Iran, it's public college. Uh, and sanctions on ICC officials. How do you, I mean, I used to say last week, how do you get more lawless than sanctions on uh, on top prosecutors at international court, I guess by attacking the US Capitol. So, um, you know, anyway, there's dozens of steps like these that can be taken and, and campaigns that you can get involved in that are pushing them forward. Uh, things also that a President Biden could do with Congress, join the International Criminal Court and these brutal deadly sanctions on various countries repeal the Selective Service Act uh, to comply with the Constitution rather than compelling young women uh, to, uh, to submit to being drafted to kill and die against their will as a, as a matter of equal rights uh, and feminism. Um, things that, that we can do, we can support Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's uh, several terrific pieces of legislation. We can talk about those organize and educate online, 
uh, build relationships across the world with Zoom, create uh, a, a culture of peace, uh, use billboards like the one that I, I showed in one of these slides, use our online courses, uh, pass local resolutions, et cetera, et cetera. These are just examples. Um, I also want to note the, the topic of, of how we talk, um, you know, that we, we, militarism just saturates our language uh, and we should try to get away from it. And, you know, having these Zoom calls with people from around the world has helped a lot where we, where we use the word we to mean we caring, good uh, activist people from around the globe, as opposed to we meaning the Pentagon. I mean, I've, I've gone to jail with peace activists who turn to me and, uh, you know, and say, we just bombed Afghanistan, y you know, <laughs> when, when this is somebody, you know, locked up for protesting against you know, bombing Afghanistan, so using the first person in that way. Um, so this is the declaration of peace. This is the entire text of it. This is a pledge that World Beyond War developed on the day we created our organization uh, seven years ago. And it's been signed by people in 189 countries. Uh, and you can sign it and organizations can sign it uh, at those websites. Um, and, and so in, in conclusion of this uh, sharing screen, I'll stop sharing screen. Uh, I, I would love to, well, you know, maybe this can actually wait until we have questions and answers and be better then. But I want, I want to ask the same question again uh, and see if any more hands or fewer hands go up than last time. But why don't we, why don't we switch over to, to Q&A time? Okay. Uh, now is the time to go ahead and unmute yourselves. Uh, if you got video, show yourself so we know who you are. And uh, it's now time to go on to questions. But first, let's thank our speaker. And uh, we would all like to uh, join in. And, uh, you know, the first question I have for you, David, is are you familiar with an organization called the Albert Einstein Institute? And their, and their pamphlet oh, from, uh, okay. leadership to democracy. This is the organization that Gene Sharp worked for. Yes, uh, I, I am familiar with it. Uh, I, I think reading books by Gene Sharp and similar books uh, is very, very useful. I, I think people should look at lists of thousands, uh, thousands of tactics of nonviolent activism and, yeah, and so come to understand yeah. all the disruptive and constructive and educational and, and you know, uh, tools of nonviolent activism. It, it is a million and one things. It's, you know, it's so that when we have this you know, do something in U.S. political discourse usually means bomb somebody. Should we do something or do nothing? When you learn all the variety of, uh, of tactics that get dismissed by that do nothing, it becomes even more absurd. Um, now, there are lots of legitimate uh, criticisms of that organization and of Gene Sharp uh, and ways in which nonviolent activism tactics have been used for arguably evil ends, uh, you know, but mm. a hammer that can hit in a nail can also break a window. Doesn't right. mean, doesn't mean that, that the hammer can't still hit in the nail, right? <laughs> there, we have to use tools uh, even, even if other people sometimes try to use those tools for things we disagree with. Glad to see you're familiar with them because that book, uh changed a lot of my views on a war. I was glad to see where you put out all that, uh, you know, even though World War II may have been quote unquote, a just war, I can see now where, you know, it didn't occur to me yet, yeah, we changed our views on things. I think the one thing that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going off, I'm violating my own premise here, making a statement instead of answering a question. Thanks for answering that, David. Next question, please. I want to know where the statistics came from that um, yes, David gave, gave at the beginning about um, uh, uh, you, you, you gave a lot of statistics. I'm looking in my notes to see what uh, mm -hmm. you talked about, uh, but you gave lots of statistics at the very beginning. And I was wondering 
Was it about arming dictators? Oh, how, yeah. How many, uh, yeah, governments we overthrew and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, you know what? If you go to davidswanson.org mm -hmm. and up at the top, you click mm -hmm. on war lists, uh -huh. you can find mm -hmm. all of those statistics and statistics. the books I got them you from. Uh, oh, okay. How about we can answer the question? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I'm sorry. Am I, I have. All right, next question, please. Go ahead, Lana. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, you know, first of all, now uh, let me tell you, and it's not only my opinion. Um, you know, America is still a very powerful country. I'm from Europe originally. I came from former Soviet Union. And let me tell you, very brief, all country try to have life style like here in America. America is still big example for many, many countries in this planet, okay? So, and I have question, why are you so negative about American military? Uh, you know, for your information, military help during the World War II. My pop was a veteran of World War II against the Nazi war. He was tankist and big tank, okay, uh, uh, soldier. So he suffered so much, he was wounded during the World War II. And guess what? You know who helped him? American military, uh, those soldiers who suffer, who was hungry, who was wounded. American soldiers helped so much American military. Why are you so negative? Why are you talking about like American military provoke war? Mm -hmm. What about humanitarian help for people, for soldiers during the World War II and so on? Thank you so much for your speech and I wait for your uh, answer. So the, the militaries that I'm positive about don't exist. I'm negative about it's everybody's bad. It's military. Too bad. I, I, Why are you so negative? You're from this country, you must understand. Everybody tried to be, uh, uh, America, very big example for all countries still despise all situations with coronavirus, with different situations. So many countries uh, rely on American military who come and help right, with- Lana, let, let him answer. Let him answer, yeah. please. And it's not only my opinion. Let, let, let him answer, Lana, please. Go ahead, David. I don't think it's a stupid mm. question. I don't think it's an unusual question. I don't think it's a, not a question that expresses the view of mm. millions and millions of people. I just want to try to answer it uh, to you, the extent of my ability. Um, and, you're so negative. Be, no, positive. I, I, Be a little bit positive I, about American military. Lana, let him answer, <laughs> okay? Please. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, Lana, uh, David, please go ahead and answer the question. So, so I, I swear to you, I understand the question and I want to try to answer it because I understand it and because I think it's an important question and because I think it's a question that expresses the view of millions, and millions of people. So I want to answer it Thank um, you. to the extent that I can. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to begin by pointing out mm. that I don't you know, dislike one particular military on earth. I, I'm against all mm. of them, uh, but one of them is the size, uh, you know, in terms, in budget terms, uh, and, and, and in many other terms as well, of all the rest of them put together. Uh, and so if you're going to look at the world's militaries, the mm. one that's as big as, you know, all the others put together has to stand out. Uh, and because mm. you live in that country and I live in that country, it's the topic of the conversation this evening. But we could talk about the Saudi Arabia's military or Russia's military or anybody else's military and have a similar conversation. Now that the fact that people have died in wars and suffered in wars, uh, you know, and, and that we need to remember them and respect them and mourn them and regret them and honor them and so forth is not actually a very good reason for unnecessarily leading more people to die and suffer in more wars. The position taken by Veterans for Peace, uh, a, a global organization, but, a, but an organization principally and originally in the United States the, on whose advisory board I serve, they believe that the greatest service you can do to veterans is to cease creating any more veterans. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, it, you know, it's a, it's a little tricky for some people to grasp that that isn't actually disrespecting <laughs> anyone, right? And people say, well, you're negative. You dislike wars, so mm -hmm. you hate the troops and the troops are sacred. And I say, look, I love mm -hmm. the troops. I love the troops so much that I want to give them the option of free college. Will you join me in loving the troops that much? Mm -hmm. Because the, the top answer for what are the major reasons, usually it's more than one, but what are the major reasons why you joined the US military? Well, I didn't have a good career choice. I didn't have any money for college. I had no other option. That's why I joined, right? So if you love that person, not, no. the, not the vague concept of troops, but the actual human beings who are becoming no. the sacred troops, if you love and adore and respect and honor and praise and thank for their service, that person, why not be good enough to mm -hmm. offer them the sort of choices in life that they would have if they grew up in another wealthy country instead of this one, a wealthy country that didn't dump everything into militarism. If you look at, if you look at for example, the Baltic states, mm -hmm. uh, former uh, Soviet Union, people who suffered under the Soviet Union, uh, resent the Soviet Union to this day for, you know, thousand percent clear, understandable reasons. And you look at the nonviolent revolutions they had. You look at the singing revolutions, the revolutions where they took over government buildings with unarmed crowds of people singing national mm -hmm. songs. And you say, well, that's all well and good. They threw out the Soviet Union. They got their independence. They created a little bit better place to live but they didn't kill anybody in the process. Damn it, let's go back and redo it and make sure there's a lot of killing and suffering in the process. That would be madness, right? Nobody would ever do that. And, and so, but if you look at the Cuban revolution where they had a violent revolution and you say, well, you know, they might've been able to do the same thing non-violently and got a better result without all the killing and destruction in the process that, that well, now you're, now you're, you know, this is sacrilege, you, how dare you, you know? And, and so my, my point is not that nothing good has ever come out of every single thing, right? I mean, I'm sure Hitler was nice to somebody, petted a dog once or something, right? I mean, but there's nothing accomplished mm -hmm. by militarism that can't be better accomplished without it. This is my point. And, and mm -hmm. so it's not that it's not that countries don't need to be helped. It's not that people don't need to be helped. Uh, but my God, take 5% of the US military budget uh, and start transforming the world. Do you know how many terrorist attacks have been motivated by resentment against a country that provided food and water and medicine? Not yet a single one. Do you know how many, do you know what percentage of suicide terrorist attacks in the world are motivated by resentment against a foreign invasion and occupation? About 95%, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, why, if, if Canada wanted to generate resentment and hatred and anti-Canadian terrorist networks, they would have to start bombing and invading and occupying on the U.S. scale, right? But the U.S. could stop digging the hole it's in, stop doing what's making matters worse. Uh, you know, it's not productive. It's not helpful. Um, and you know, you can you can look at all the all the evils of of the Soviet Union, all the evils of the current Russia. Everybody's got a horrible government. Find me as somebody who doesn't. But who who promised not to expand NATO and now has it on the border? Who pro, who promised not to put weapons on the border and now is putting missiles into Romania and Poland? Who's holding the biggest war rehearsal exercises in several decades? on the border without a buffer zone, who's threatening Russia, who walked out of the major disarmament treaties, who's, you know, who's lying and, and accusing and, uh, and creating hostility and a, and a new Cold War to sell weapons, you know, the, the US government. So there's, there's plenty of blame to go around and when I talk to my Russian mm -hmm. friends, I tell them to deal with the Russian government. But which government do I have the most leverage with? If you know, and it's very little, the U.S. government.
Mm -hmm. I was going to say, who thank cares what's going to make as long as it makes a profit? Turn off. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for the answer. That's a bad joke. You're very welcome. Thank you for asking. Thank you. All right, who has the next question, I, please? I have a question. Uh, Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, um, I agree with you. Thank you. And I've had your books. You have the War State, right? I think um, I read a long time ago. But um, how, I'm so impressed with what you do. How, you know, you say you only have a tiny bit of leverage. And that's what's so frustrating. I, I guess I, a question might be like, you know, how have you evolved in this uh, to where you are now? And, and what are your challenges? And what, you know, how can we make it better? And with one specific idea I have is this covert operations, the, you know, the way that history is revised. And um, I don't, I think Americans are particularly unaware of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, it's, we're so powerless to influence our government with, you know, your good ideas, but uh, I don't know how we can get, I wish they were in the curriculum. I wish we had one set of facts, uh, you know, committed to it. Maybe there's an amendment or, you know, anyhow, um, you know, what can we, how can we be more effective in getting your message out there? Uh, wonderful question. Thanks. Uh, you're, I'll pay you later. Um, the, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the field of peace studies uh, is just growing exponentially, uh, extremely rapidly. And, uh, and a lot of it, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it, you know, drifts a little off topic. It's not about ending war. It's about every other noble cause under the sun. But a lot of it is about ending war and creating systems and structures that uh, prevent war. Um, and uh, more and more universities uh, have peace studies and more and more uh, secondary and primary schools have got some sort of peace mm. studies. And there are lots of groups that have developed mm. curricula, have written books, World Beyond War has written books that are good for this. Uh, and the thing mm. to do is to talk to school boards and to talk to teachers and to talk to students and work to get to get speakers into classrooms, you know, via Zoom, if not in person. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a speakers bureau. If you look at worldbeyondwar.org slash speakers. Mm. Uh, and we have our own online courses uh, that we that that we give people certificates for. And, and you know, we have mm. six week courses on uh, war abolition and on war and the environment and on World War II and other topics. Uh, and we encourage people to take those courses and encourage others to take those courses. Um, we're developing a, a, a youth network at World Beyond War that you know spreads ideas among young people. Um, but there's, you know, in, in terms of what well, you mentioned, covert actions and what happens secretly. I, I mean, this is a this is a particular uh, grievance of mine as well. It, it seems outrageous. Uh, to have a government that proclaims itself democratic uh, and throws around the word democracy and representative government when it's when it's bombing other countries, you know, and and, and yet major operations happening in in secrecy, right? And to, you now have you know nominees for the cabinet who censored the vast majority of a Senate report on torture, uh, who in fact waived the punishments and, and bestowed medals and awards on people who had <laughs> hacked into the Senate's computers to sabotage their report on, on torture. This is, you know, people who've done this are now going before that Senate uh, as nominees oh. for cabinet positions. It's gonna be very interesting. Um, but Which ones? Mm -hmm. I think, well, it, I, I'm thinking be of, specific. I, I, I'm thinking of Ms. Haynes, Avril Haynes in particular at the moment. Okay. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, but if, uh, you know, Trump a couple weeks ago uh, in the, you know, even a radioactive broken clock is right twice a, twice a presidency, right? Trump proposed uh, taking the military, taking military support away from the CIA a couple of weeks ago. And the thing that the really insidious thing that's happened in the past four years in terms of liberal political understanding is this notion that that somehow Trump is pro evil Russia and Trump is is 
anti, you know, holy NATO. And, and we should be on board with Cold Wars and bases and weapons sales and NATO expansion because we're anti-Trump. I applaud everyone for being anti-Trump, but you don't have to be anti-peace because Trump happens to say the word peace on Christmas. I mean, you, you, you got to have some, yeah. some consistent independent standards, right? But taking the military away from the CIA, even taking the half of the CIA that was never supposed to exist away from the CIA and having it just investigate things, uh, you know, would be a huge step if you can't get rid of it entirely. Um, you know, why have a secret agency murdering people and anybody right. who's nearby them with missiles? It's outrageous. Uh, right. And then using psychological operations um, to confuse okay, us okay. about uh, what they're doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Ellen, we're gonna have a lot more okay. things. Karina asked for the next question, so go ahead, Karina. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if we dismantle our military, aren't we gonna be a target? Uh, and aren't other people going to start attacking us? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> most absolutely not. Uh, the United States uh, has generated a great deal of, of blowback and hostility and threat and antagonism with its military. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the people who just want to reduce the military by 10 or 20 percent, uh, and those of us who want to reduce it by 100%, mm -hmm. what we want to do this year is the exact same thing. We want to reduce it by 10 or 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we're in absolute agreement on what should be done. We just have a little disagreement about how to talk about it. Um, and if you were to mm -hmm. get rid of only the weapons that are misnamed in the so-called Defense Department, uh, which was, you know, renamed the Defense Department right after World War II. Uh, if you were to get rid of stealth bombers that can start nuclear wars undetected in distant lands because they aren't defensive, and you were to line your coasts and borders with missiles and every exotic weapon and troop and ship you wanted, but not have bases in everyone else's country and not have aircraft carriers in everyone else's sea, and not like Hillary Clinton tell Goldman Sachs that the South China Sea needs to be renamed and the Pacific belongs to the United States, but actually maybe start thinking about what it, how, you would, how you would respond to China renaming the Chesapeake Bay, right? I mean, you, you just, if you were to scale back to something that could be called defensive correctly, the proper use of language, well, you're going to get rid of the vast majority of the U.S. military. And, and I'm not telling you to do that. I'm saying let's get rid of 10 or 20 percent of it and watch the reverse arms race. And if anyone wants to take a bet with me, I'm ready. I don't have any money, but I'm ready. Uh, it, it, if, you know, the, the, the big evil China that, you know, spends under a third of what the United States does on its military spends more when the U.S. does and less when the U.S. does. So you want to start a reverse arms race, it's in your power. You want to radically reduce the militarism of, of most of the, uh, of the other war makers on the planet. You simply stop selling them weapons. You stop selling weapons to the Soviet, to, to, the, to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates immediately uh, and stop participating in, in your humanitarian war with the, with the worst human rights abusing nation on the planet, the Saudi Arabia. Uh, you pass Congresswoman Omar's bill to stop arming human rights abusers. If a nation is a horrible human rights abuser, you don't sell it weapons of war. Now, how in the hell you use weapons of war without abusing human rights is beyond me, but, it's a, but that would be a major step in the right direction that the United States could take. This notion that the weapons industry is somehow patriotic, I mean, I, I want, we can have a conversation about the evils of patriotism, but this is, you know, the U.S. <laughs> weapons companies arm everybody. Find me a war without U.S. weapons on both sides. Find me one. You know, the, so... You, you, want to, you want to start a reverse arms race, disarm the people you think are coming to get you and take away your freedoms, stop arming them would be a first step. Okay. Um, who's got the next question? If not, I'm going to ask, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Richard, go ahead, please. And then Charlie. 
Um, I heard, and I, may, I don't know if this is right or wrong, that the US alone spends 43% of, of the total world uh, money on so-called defense. And it would take anywhere from, I've heard different numbers, 12 to 17 other countries to equal what we do. And even if it's 12 or 17, the same answer comes up that only two of those things are our enemies. So uh, when you consider us and our, and our so-called allies in this, it seems like we're spending an awful lot of money against nobody. I mean, you mentioned that the Chinese spend a third, I heard a sixth of what we spend. The Russians don't spend a whole lot. Um, and the Chinese can't even make an aircraft engine that works um, to fly their fighters and so on. So it just seems like it's a fundamental huge waste of money to get for no benefit at all uh, in our security. Is that, does that seem like a reasonable balance to you or a reasonable uh, assessment of the numbers? Um. I mean, Russia is five or six percent and shrinking. They're actually spending less on their military. Um, you know, Iran is, is perhaps under one percent. Um, it's you know, it's it's very unusual for a country uh, to spend in the in the tens of billions, right? And the United States is spending. I mean, if the 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 numbers that people most often use for these comparisons come from SIPRI, S-I-P-R-I, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Uh, they leave out a great deal of U.S. military spending. They, you know, clock U.S. military spending in the 700 billions, uh, whereas if we add it all in, we know it's at a trillion and a quarter or so. Uh, but we don't have the data to be able to, to make that apples to apples comparison with all the other countries. But yes, if you look at, at the numbers from CIPRI, you're, you're basically right. The United States is, you know, 45% or something of, of world military spending. Uh, and most, uh, most of the other big spenders are close US allies and NATO members. Um, but I would and if you look at what, you know, officials in the Pentagon tell reporters at places like Politico, they tell them all of this, all of this, you know, brouhaha about the Russian threat and the Chinese threat. It's to sell weapons, boys and yeah. girls. It's it's bureaucracy. NATO doesn't <laughs> want to go out of business. They, they, they tell this to journalists, you know, they were, it's, it's as if we couldn't spot it ourselves, right? But I want to quibble with your use of the term security about something that makes us less safe, not more safe. I wanna quibble with your use of the word we to mean 4% of humanity. I identify with 100% of humanity. And I wanna quibble with your identification of a couple of countries as enemies. Why are there enemies? Who gets to say they're enemies? Where, is the, where, where does the constitution make them enemies? Where does legislation make them enemies? Where, does, where do facts make them enemies? We, we ought to get to choose, at least on our own Zoom calls, uh, who's an enemy and who isn't. Okay. Okay, um, next I think is Charlie, unless you were done, Richard. I'm done. I have a question, quick question. No, no, no it's going to be Charlie next and okay. Rosalie. And then I have right. a question too. Okay, I'm going to go Charlie, then Rosalie, then Dan, then Ellen, if you don't mind, okay? All right. All right. So, Charlie, please go ahead. Yeah, David, I, I occasionally see this commercial on television where the teenager asks his mom if they should join the army or something and everything turns out okay. You know, it's like a job, job, uh, jobs program, you know. What is your candid opinion of uh, military recruitment? I would prefer peace recruitment. I would prefer that it hadn't taken me many years to find out you could work for a peace movement and that there was a peace movement. I would prefer that there be billboards and uh, and television ads and print ads and, uh, and that peace organizations were sponsoring sports teams and race cars and uh, quietly slipping money to the sports leagues to celebrate peace flags and peace activists before every game. But that's not the country we're living in at the moment. At the moment, it's, it's you know, your beloved sacred tax dollars quietly going under the door to the NFL and the 
Major League Baseball, you know, to get these celebrations of flags and troops and officers and war songs uh, before every game uh, and, and quietly consulting with Hollywood movie producers. And it's, it's just, it's, it's everywhere. It's culture saturation. Uh, and uh, again, if it, were, if it were necessary, inevitable, noble, uh, glorious, why would it take such a massive investment in advertising, never mind recruiting? Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it strikes me as, uh, as absurd. Uh, you know, if, why, why, not, uh, why not save the tax dollars? Imagine the, the human good, uh, the environmental good that could be done just with the, just with the war advertising dollars. Uh, and imagine the cultural benefits uh, if those dollars were put to other use, and and I, I I'm glad once again to to learn another reason why I'm glad that I don't watch television. <laughs> okay, I believe Rosalie, you have the next question. If you want to go ahead. Okay. First, thank you, David. Hi, Rosalie. Um, as usual, you tell it like it is. Um, I have. One question I want to ask about what we're talking about and another one about what's happening today, right now. Anyway, my first question is how can we convince our new Congress to cut the military budget and fund the health and survival services our country and the world so desperately needs? I mean, it is not a partisan issue. The Democrats are as bad as the Republicans. My Jan Sikowski always votes for all the military budget, even if she's a member of the Progressive Caucus. How are we gonna get these people to cut the damn budget? My second question is, I learned this afternoon that um, what happened Wednesday is not the end, it's going to be repeated. And, you know, I've written books about resisting um, repression and arrest and being arrested for nonviolence. But what can we do when people who are armed are th threatening our democracy? I mean, we're obviously no longer an exceptional nation, but what can we do to keep our democracy in the next two weeks, even though this is not what we were planning to talk about today. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Rosalie, and for everything you do and for several questions, each of which could take hours. So I'll try to yeah. give a cursory uh, answer to, uh, to each of them. But I think, you know, principally we got to do more and better thanking and spanking. We got to reward those Congress members who have done right on, on joining Barbara Lee. Lee's legislation to move 350 billion on on voting last summer to move uh, 10 percent uh, and and on uh, and on supporting uh, current efforts and joining the proper caucuses and making it mean something and, and I think again overwhelmingly the best strategy uh, to move away from military madness is going to be to work with the Green New Deal uh, and make it what AOC calls an internationalized Green New Deal, what some of us call a demilitarized Green New Deal, that is a Green New Deal that doesn't pretend that, that militarism doesn't exist and isn't the principal thing the US government does, but takes it into account and acts on it. I, I think the fact that the Progressive Caucus is redoing their rules and getting stricter with their members and proposing that it actually means something, that it not just be uh, you know, something you toss to your constituents, but you actually have to act in certain progressive ways, that mm -hmm. Lee and Pocan are creating a military spending reduction <laughs> caucus uh, that I'm hoping is going to be serious in similar ways. Uh, we need to get every Congress member into that and shame anyone who isn't. Uh, I, I think, 
you know, I, I, I quibble, you know, I, I have to argue with everybody who asks great questions, as all of you do, because I like to argue with things. But this threat to our democracy, what the hell democracy are you talking about? When did this place ever have a democracy? And, and where is it? And how can I get my hands on it? Uh, this is an oligarchy with a certain pretense of representation uh, and the slight occasional ability of the public to influence things in, in a minor way. Uh, and, and we can't afford to lose what we've got. We can't make it worse. But if the Democratic Party, if the liberals, if the leftists, if the centrists had ever given anybody what they needed, people wouldn't be turning to right wing fascists. The, the, the Trumpists wouldn't have any power if if the Democrats ever gave anybody employment or health care or retirement or a sustainable environment uh, or you know, Two thousand dollar checks, right? Uh, and, and so we, we, you, you saw the Democrats come in with both houses with Obama and give people nothing for two years, and then give the majorities to the Republicans. This is what the Democrats will do unless they get serious about the sort of agenda of the guy who they stomped out of out of the primaries, right? Uh, the guy who's now the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. Um, and, and so, I, I, I mean, the first thing that has to be done is impeachment and, and conviction, right? I, I mean, and you impeach not just so Trump doesn't get retirement benefits, but so that he's barred from running for office again, uh, and, and so that he's removed from office immediately. And you do it even after he's removed from office if necessary, which is totally legitimate, because the principal thing you're doing is setting a precedent that we have nonviolent tools we can use and we'll use them. Uh, and we'll use them for legitimate things. It doesn't have to be lies about Russia. It doesn't have to be a sex affair. It can be, it can be an abuse of power, you know, and better late than never and better this one than none of them. Uh, you know, so, so that's the immediate demand. Stop, you know, stop pretending that Mike Pence is going to do your job for you, Ms. Pelosi, and do your job for yourself and impeach this fascist immediately. I mean, that's step number one. And you can get on to pushing uh, the Biden White House to do what needs to be done if it wants to if it wants to stay around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dan, you got the next question. Brief, please. You give me hope to keep working. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Dan, you had a quite you had the next question. So go ahead. All right. All right. My question is, um, my question is, have you heard of the time when, um, what's his name? Uh, the secretary of state for George W. Bush or no, the old Bush, um, uh, Colin Powell was being interviewed at the UN in front of Picasso's, uh, Guernica. And uh, you know it shows people getting blown up into little bits and animals being blown up by bombs, and uh, they had to move the interview away from Picasso's painting because it was too controversial. Did you hear about that? <laughs> my my recollection is so is just meaninglessly and slightly different. I I thought that what they did was put up a big curtain and cover it um, at, at the request of the United States because they didn't want an anti-war painting behind a sales pitch for a war. Um, which, you know, you wouldn't, right? I guess so. I guess a, a curtain a curtain was was useful. I guess. All right. Thank Ellen, you. Okay, Ellen, you have the next question. So go ahead. Um, okay, um, I'm wondering whether you, well, a couple things, but they're kind of pretty different. One is, you know, you talked about ending mass incarceration, and I'm wondering how you think we should or could or should go about doing that. Um, that would be my first question. <laughs> Oh, well, I claim zero expertise on ending mass incarceration. I was just throwing out an example of if we wanted to accomplish some social change uh, this year or next year, uh, you know, for good or for bad uh, that, that you agree with me on or don't, 
uh, the first step oughtn't to be to kill lots of young people in fields uh, and then pass a bill to, to do what needs to be done. We ought to just jump straight to passing a bill to, needs to do what needs to be done. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I do think mm -hmm. uh, we ought to radically decrease uh, incarceration. I think it's rather shameful not only to be waging wars in the name of freedom that strip everyone of freedoms, uh, but, mm -hmm. but to be doing it uh, as, the, as the place on earth that locks up more people in cages than anywhere else. I mean, if any country was going to be bombing people for freedom, Freedom. shouldn't the last country on the list for that job be the one that's got more people in cages per capita and absolute than anybody else? I would think so. Um, I, I do think that you can, you can get rid of, of requirements, uh, third strike penalties. You can give more flexibility to judges. You can use more uh, programs of, of, of diversion from unnecessary incarceration. You can radically reduce mm -hmm. sentences across the board in proportion. Uh, you can invest in actual rehabilitation uh, and post-release rehabilitation. Uh, and first and foremost, you can create a nice, safe, prosperous place to live uh, that doesn't generate as much crime and violence uh, and, and prosecutions in the first place, which costs dramatically less financially than the, the system of, of mass incarceration. This is the, you know, not something <laughs> that's controversial or remotely new, uh, it's just something we need the political will to address. <laughs> Okay, um, the, another question I had, and this, this is kind of a, a different subject is, do you feel like, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like we have such vast polarization in this country. Um, mm -hmm. You got people like Hillary Clinton who was going around talking mm -hmm. about the basket full of deplorables, which is not, not a good way to build bridges. Um, do you think, I mean, I, I personally think that there, there's a danger with, with um, Facebook and Twitter and all this censorship. <clears throat> if you don't allow people's grievances to be heard, then that, that could lead to increased um, social unrest. What, what do you think about that? Uh, uh, again, I agree, and you raise a number of huge topics that we could talk hours about. Uh, not that I necessarily have the expertise to justify those hours, but but I do think uh, that that there is way too much division, way too much partisanship, way too much black and white ism. Uh, I, I mean, I uh, I can't tell you how many people were I, I objected I, I I post I tweeted on Twitter something just mourning the death of a woman who got shot in the US Capitol and just hundreds of sadistic <laughs> responses she shouldn't have been there she deserved it wow. right now because she was on that side instead of the other side right and of course you've got mm -hmm. just as much or more sadism and hate from from that other side and and uh, I, I think we mm -hmm. have to learn to be respectful and ask you know why why is someone racist why is someone hateful why is someone angry because there are explanations there are reasons uh, and some of them have to do with with problems that shouldn't persist i mean wh why why do countries like scandinavian countries that just give public benefits to everybody across the board health care retirement uh pensions vacations etc uh do so much better mm -hmm. than a country that doles everything out based on, on the worthy and the unworthy and whether you're in this group or that group or you're quite poor enough or you're, you're quite black enough or you're, you're, you're this gender or you've mm -hmm. suffered this outrage. And it's all about, it's all about compensation for, for wrongs. And, and I'm not against mm -hmm. compensation for wrongs and reparations and undoing evils of the past, but it's always divisive. It's always divisive and, yeah. and, and it's never let's do away with every unkind statement. 
It's let's do away with this certain type of unkind statement, right? So, you know, go watch, uh, go to Netflix or Amazon and watch like a stand up comedian. And, and it won't take you long to, to hear jokes about white people, right? <laughs> And, I, and, and, and of course they're funny, they're jokes. And of course it would be offensive to have jokes about black people. It wouldn't just be offensive, it wouldn't be there because it's, it's not tolerated anymore. And, it, and of course it's ridiculous for white men to think they're the big oppressed victimized group. It's, it's laughably sick, right? But there are reasons, right? They, they notice that it's acceptable to make fun of white people, but nobody else. Right? They notice that that affirmative action is for groups that have suffered historical wrongs that don't include them, even though they, like everybody else on the planet, have suffered historical wrongs. Right, So you know, we have to have enough respect to talk to people and, and, and show them what we have in common, uh, even though we're disgusted mm -hmm. and offended by things they think and do. OK. All right. Um... At, at this point, uh, seeing as how the chat room is going mm -hmm. crazy, uh, I'd like to open it up to rebuttals right now. And uh, but real mm -hmm. quick, I do want to welcome a gentleman by the name of C Cesar e, and he's got something called the Igora Project. And uh, he's been actually doing something to try to, you know, help end war and a few things with his something called the International Logic Party. What I'd like to do now is go put, open up to rebuttals. I'd like to have Caesar Caesar go first. I'll get each All and right, every. Let's thank our speaker. You're right, Shirley. I'm sorry, I forgot to thank our speaker tonight. Thank uh, you, thank you. All right, Ellen. It <laughs> looks like we had a good round of questions and answers tonight. So now we'll officially go into rebuttals. And uh, Caesar, if you're ready. Uh, would you tell the speaker he's got the? Okay, he's everybody's going to have about five minutes now for for rebuttals. And, uh, you know, Caesar has spoken at the mm -hmm. college before about something called the Igora and the International Logic Party. So please present mm -hmm. uh, Caesar. And I know he wanted to extend it and uh, an ex he wanted to extend you an invitation, David, to speak at his group. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he'll tell you more about it. So Caesar, go ahead, please. Unmute. Mm -hmm. Thank you for such a, a warm welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. I've returned back to the States. I was out in Europe organizing there for quite some time, which was very interesting. Uh, again, International Logic Party, we're bringing together people from around the world. And the amazing thing is that it's really working uh, because I can tell you one thing, in our meetings, what we have found is that when people come together and actually focus on solving our problems, mm -hmm. unless you specifically ask somebody you're most likely not gonna find out that they're from a different country than you because they're actually facing the same problems that we are. They have the same corrupt politicians, mm -hmm. they have the same corrupt systems. So actually we really are all in this together. Uh, that's just from a lot of experience from, like I said, from around the world. But let me backtrack a little bit and just tell you about who we are and how we work. So I represent the international <laughs> Uh, the International Logic mm -hmm. Party itself does not represent any ideology, and it never will. It's actually a system of democracy where the people have real power. Um, we just have five very straightforward principles that create a fair, fair ground for everybody. But the party then uses this new technology. It's a new kind of networking platform. It's called Igora, the Worldwide Stock Market of Ideas. And Igora enables every person to develop their own political philosophy out of various ideas, to then show which of those ideas are most strongly supported by the people. And then according to that, using a very simple algorithm, we're able to create lists of political candidates who most closely represent the will of the people. So essentially, instead of all the money ties and all the backroom deals that are made to create our politicians, it's math. It's, and you really can't trick it. Uh, long story, we could talk about that privately, about the details of it. But the point is, is we're, we're able to algorithmically create lists of political candidates who most closely represent the will of the people. Whoever is at the top of the list, sure, we give them a shot, uh, but if they don't perform to our expectations, guess what? We have somebody waiting in line ready to replace them. So we're essentially making politicians completely replaceable and outsourcing the government to the people. Because the point is that this platform, the purpose of it, is so that we can have a real citizen democracy where people really come together. Actually, essentially very much like the College of Complexes, 
we call it citizen assembly. And, but the format is actually very similar to, to the format of the college because it's such an effective format. And so it's an opportunity for people, for the mm -hmm. ideas that we support in Igora. Although you're not required mm -hmm. to use Igora, but still anyone is wel welcome to participate. But the, but the essential premise is that we don't want to just hear people mm -hmm. criticizing other people's ideas. If you don't like someone's idea, give us a better idea, you know? So it becomes a very collaborative and a very constructive process. But like I said, it's an open forum. It's a free speech forum where people have the opportunity to present their ideas, to listen to other people, to learn about different things, deliberate all of those issues, and then make it, each person makes their own decision about which ideas they think are good and which ideas they're gonna support in their ideological profile. And those are the ideas that rise to the top. So David, I wanna reach out to you with an invitation to join us at Citizen Assembly. We actually have several meetings throughout the week. We organize them regularly. And this is all decentralized. Anybody can organize Citizen Assemblies whenever and wherever democracy is convenient for them. We want democracy to be happening everywhere, including at the bus stops, at the dinner tables, so that these conversations that people are having are always impactful. They're always being measured. The public will is, is what is, is paramount. And so David, I'd like to invite you to join us in Citizen Assembly. I'd like to invite you and everyone else to use Igora, but especially David, I'm very curious what specific idea you would put forward within our format, because it does have to be uh, one of the things that we say, if, in, if you think an idea is good enough to present, uh, then it definitely deserves to be written down so that you can make it easy for other people to actually take that idea and use it and then pass it on to the next person. And so actually with me, I do wanna recognize one of my colleagues, Cynthia Leonard is here. She organizes Citizen Assembly Women on Sundays to kind of take the edge off, maybe take a little bit of the testosterone, uh, you know, turn that down a little bit. But we also have Citizen Assembly Women on Wednesdays. I also organize one on Sunday mornings. Um, uh, we have Stacy Gustafson. She's not here right now. She's she's organizing a different take on that. Uh, Ramses is actually, we have a Canadian with us uh, joining us uh, from Montreal. So. Um, she also organizes, helps organize some meetings, co-host meetings. So anyways, the point is, is here the people have real power. So David, introduce your idea, everyone else, and this is an opportunity. Whatever idea you introduce, other people, if that idea speaks for them, they can take that idea and copy it for themselves and then use it and then pass it on so that other people can be made aware of that. So uh, I wanna wrap up. I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, and one other thing, we're looking for candidates. We want people who are actually going to represent the will of the people. We're trying to make candidates replaceable, and we know there are plenty of good people that can, can actually mm -hmm. represent the will of the people. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for good people to step up so they don't have to be corrupted by all of the different deals and, and essentially the, you know, the, the prostitution of uh, you know, selling yourselves for money just to get elected. So we're putting an end to all of that, but we need candidates who are gonna represent people's ideas. And let's, uh, let's take back our government. It's, okay. We have the technology. I'm gonna share some information in the chat right now. Uh, so please check that out. Thank you so much. Ramses, I know you've been very active in the chat. You've got five mm -hmm. minutes. You wanna say something with to the group as a whole? It's rebuttal time. You got five minutes. Yeah, um, th thank you so much, guys. Uh, it's my first time to join here, and it was a very nice discussion. Thank you, David, for the awesome presentation. I don't mean to initiate a fight or a war no. in the chat. You know, we are we are here talking about peace. Um, uh, however, I I just felt that some of the suggestions in David's presentation are kind of impractical, like stopping the war on Yemen and Afghanistan, while we had just had a bombing in Yemen just a few days ago, you know? So how, how can you ensure peace without having you, unfortunately, without having uh, a military solution? But other than that, of course, uh, I support many of the points <clears throat> that have been raised by David, and I hope that we can live in a peaceful world someday where there is no weapons, there is no military, there is no soldier at all. Is that mm -hmm. all you wanted to say, Ramses, or did you want to get a few mm -hmm. more minutes? If not, I'll move on. 
I, I, I'm very good. I will yield the floor to other people to express themselves as well. Well, th thank you, Ramses, for clarification. Uh, Daniel, are you there? All right, anybody else? Okay, now we're going to open it up to anybody else who wants to rebut. So, uh, Bob, I know you're always good for one. You want to get down the next rebuttal? Mm -hmm. I guess Bob's not ready. All right, who wants to speak next? I'll go. All right, all right Cynthia, we'll get you in, and uh, then we'll go with Ellen. Uh, David, I would I would like to thank you very much. I'm very grateful for this conversation. I, I sincerely wish I had been here at the beginning because this is something very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I am actually a veteran, and I all, I also have a son that that would have that signed up for selective service, and the day he turned 25 and and was no longer eligible was a day I celebrated with great great enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I do understand Ramses's points. Uh, I, I don't know if you've been reading the chat, but, but yeah, we do have enemies. I would say that many of those enemies are justified, um, but we do have enemies. Uh, 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 would you agree that nuclear, uh, nuclear armament is not the best way to, to confront those enemies? I mean, they're basically hopelessly outgunned by, by the military we have now, I, I don't see escalation as, as being beneficial to anyone. I just like to say a few words about how this has gone. I think it was so wonderful that we could hear David Swanson. I hope that we can get access to his wonderful um, slides and stuff because they're just so good in spreading the word. But I want to talk about the chat because I was constantly, it was like everybody was talking at once. We were hearing all these good things on the Zoom and then all this good stuff was going on in the chat. And I don't know, I mean, but I think maybe the College of Complexes can kind of figure it out because when we were used to meet in real time, we didn't interrupt each other. We didn't carry on all these side conversations or not very many of them. And we need to be concentrated on what's talking. So please address that because this was wonderful, but I mean, I finally gave up on the chat and didn't even answer what people were asking me because you know, I couldn't be too many places. So just think about organizing it somehow. Well, Thank now's, you. your, now's your time to comment on the chat. If you have anything else you want to add? Uh, who? Okay, uh, mm -hmm. Ellen, then we'll let guess you're next. Okay. Um, I guess I, I really, really impressed, uh, loved hearing this talk. Uh, it gave me a sense that's that's what I believe in. <laughs> I, I need to join your group. Uh, I'm, um, you know, peace. And it, it's interesting, you know, to me, I'm, I don't, it seems like for the last 10 years or 20 since whenever since 9 11 or like, it's I, this divide and conquer. I'm kind of like, what is driving? things seem to be getting worse rather than better. And I um, I think it's largely the media and a deliberate strategy of the CIA, the NSA, um, since 1947, the National Security Act, uh, they put in covert operations. And Truman then later, when Kennedy was, was assassinated, said, if I knew that that's what I was signing, I never would have signed it. Um, but, you know, we now, it's so clear to me that it is that CIA, the National Security Act, that's driving this, uh, our war machine and, our, you know, our war state, as your book says. Um, and it, but, it, and I just keep, you know, all I can do is think, how can we, uh, how can we stop it? And it, it is like the invisible man. I, I read, uh, this book on um, media communications analyst, Noel Noman said in fascist countries, there's, um, they make the media, uh, we're atomized and separated and silenced into a spiral of silence because, uh, you know, we're, it, it, what occurs to me, we need a content analysis that I don't hear 
peace, you know, studies, um, like you're saying on the radio where I listen to NPR all day. It should have been educational. I think it, 10 years ago, it was more, it did seem to be pushed towards peace. And, um, but ever since there, they moved into the Voice of America building in Washington, uh, this woman Goldie took over in, in Chicago. I know now she's in New York. Um, people went unionized, but uh, it's clearly more capital. You know, um, George Seldes, this great investigative journalist, uh, socialist, uh, born in 1888, but he, he, um, he had, there's a great documentary, Tell the Truth and Run, the, the George Seldes story that you hardly see or hear, you know? So I guess peace seems to be um, censored, you know? And uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, Hitler's crown jurist and philosopher came up at, you know, NATO, Gladio, this team B strategy was developed in World War, after World War II by Hitler's Reinhard Gellin. And the idea was to have terrorists you know, covert warfare going around. Always blame it on the communists and the the peaceniks and the you know um you know the people, the blacks, the the you know it's this invisible man in the media with all the power and all the money and all the lobbyist influence and the one who gets our Congress people and senators. They have to agree not to vote not to ever sign any environmental legislation. They have to agree not to um, end war, you know, not to go against Israel, you know, this, so this impact of APAC, the American Israeli political action and the NRA, and it's covert and they just keep erasing the, you know, you're looking for like evidence that why, you know, that they're there and they are deliberately um, driving us to war. It is so frustrating, right? Because the language I love, you know, I've got to just study all your courses and um, I'd like to hear more books. And, and I think I will sign up for a peace studies program, but it, I guess I'm kind of, the question is how can we not be depressed? Cause you know, is, are there any, I have a background in research. Are there any sociological research to say it's getting worse because of the way the media is and if so could put back in the fairness doctrine that uh forces the media to work for all of us i'll end there thank you okay all right uh <laughs> now it's who's next who wants to speak next come on we got it we got an open platform and we got somebody who wants to speak next uh Jim, should I reply to all these comments at some okay. point or what you're gonna do is at the end of the night you'll get the last word and you'll mm -hmm. be able to reply to everything else. So uh, the speaker always gets the last word. I forgot to mention mm -hmm. that in the comments. So you'll be able to get uh, a chance to rebut everybody and take as long as you need. All right, who else is speaking? Who else wants a rebuttal? Mm -hmm. Charlie, I know you got one in you, and I know Bob, you, well, maybe Bob's not here anymore. Mm -hmm. Bob, you always got a good one in there. So why don't you go ahead or, or uh, some of the others who haven't done. Daniel, I know you were kind of active in the chat. Do you have one to rebut with at this point? Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Daniel Tweed. I ran twice, actually, here in Thousand Oaks, California for the local city council seat. It's a five-person, you know, municipal corporation board. But I, I just kind of ran to, you know, put ideas out there into the public idea, uh, the public sphere. Um, you know, normally they give you like a three-minute public comment period. So I kind of saw that as my uh, extended public comment period. <laughs> I got to go on the ladies, you know, the Women's League of Voter uh, Zoom debates and got to debate the, you know, present the Islamic Society. It was pretty great, you know, it's like, uh, so I got like, uh, first time I ran, I got like one and a half percent. And the second time uh, this year, I got 3.5 percent. So I'm on track to double in 2022, maybe. And I, I ran as a transhumanist uh party member there's a there's a united states transhumanist party and what they do is they want to put science and health at the forefront of politics you know get rid of this trench warfare kind of you know uh candidate mano a mano thing and uh, just do things that actually prepare us for some of the big you know uh 
technological fates that are rushing toward us, like, you know, uh, nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. I mean, Elon Musk says artificial intelligence is the scariest thing that he thinks, you know, we have coming up, you know, on our plate. And is the government talking about it? Are we prepared for this? Are we thinking about it or dealing with it? So, you know, I see there's a real disconnect in, in politics. It's, it's really not addressing the, the relevant existential threats or, you know, what, what constitutes quality progress or, you know, even the quality vote. Right now, most of our votes are binary. They're just yes or no. That's like so ancient. There's a whole spectrum of, of left out, excluded middle, you know, to, to talk like Aristotle. You know, when you when you make things just a, a one or the other, you're excluding this this virtually infinite range of middle possibilities. So I, I think there's a convergence of you know identity and uh, cryptocurrency and uh, quality voting that is probably you know if we don't do it, the authoritarians are going to do it. Like China already has this really terrible social credit surveillance state, you know. And the only way to fix that is like David Brin, the science fiction writer, wrote a book, The Transparent Society. We all have to be able to, to see if there's going to be surveillance, we should all be able to surveil each other. Because if you have lopsided surveillance, you know, that's like the worst of all possible worlds. So it's called surveillance when everyone can kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> see what everyone else is doing. The Transparent Society, right? So um, I've got this... Uh, plan to do something called quality progress uh, coupons, uh, QPON, I've got QPON.info, and that's going to be kind of a way to run a digital, you know, uh, world citizenship kind of idea that, that creates human rights and hopefully an access trail around the world. And hopefully, you know, we can back up humanity off the planet in case we get wiped out like the dinosaurs did. You know, we should be uh, thinking about stuff like that. So that was probably five minutes. And uh, thanks for letting me ramble on there. It's actually about three, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> Ellen had Ellen had another point to make. So why don't you go ahead? I'm sorry, Cynthia. Uh, had thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to add on uh, to my comments because I actually had intended to extend an invitation to you to come to Citizens Assembly and please do a presentation on what you presented here tonight because there's so much to be discussed and and again i am just very very grateful for that thank you so much all i know is i wish i had more time to get involved with the citizens assembly because i've just been working with my toastmasters commitments it's kind of hard but uh i appreciate the work you've done all right who's next on the rebuttal uh, um, can i say something go ahead janice you're more um, than welcome you got five minutes Okay, um, there was co a conversation on the chat about uh, how people in the Muslim world, uh, you know, uh, pray death to America and stuff like that. And so I wrote that you can't measure, uh, you know, a country by a few, you know, by some fundamentalists. And, uh, and what is it? Do you live by fear? And we should have a military, what I was thinking is you should have a military because you are afraid, you know, you live in fear that, you know, people in the Muslim world are praying death to America. Um, and, uh, and Cynthia responded uh, that um, you can't deny people who just want to have their safety. And my response to that is those people who just want safety um, need to convince our country not to be belligerent. Is is that it, Janice? Yeah. Okay. Who else has a rebuttal? Um, Charlie, you want to go? No one else. I'm not sure, Charlie. I got one, a good one coming up. But do you want me to go first? Yeah, you go ahead. If you want, I'll go. Okay, Charlie, oh, go ahead. Let's Since thank Cynthia's hand everyone. Has been in the air for a long time. I'm sorry. Cynthia's hand has been raised for a long time. Yeah, I know. Cynthia, did you? I think that did, did we cover everything, Cynthia? Uh, I I just wanted to respond to Janice uh, because I think she missed the intent intention of of my uh, response to her. Okay. Uh, what I said in, in totality was uh, because she said, do you, do you live in fear? 
And I said, I do not, Janice, but the majority do. One cannot begrudge a person's desire for safety, whether it is re a realistic idea or not. And, and I would say that is a problem for the entire United States. We all, we all seem to be under the understanding that, that we can somehow be safe when nothing could be further from the truth. And, and it's just part of human nature to, to be afraid of being unsafe. Uh, that, that was all I meant by that comment. So Janice, if I offended you in any way, my most sincere apologies to all you. All right. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. All right, I hope our speaker knows he gets the final remarks. He can respond if he wants. He could just say thank you, get lost. It's up to him, but <laughs> certainly appreciate the time that you put together in that PowerPoint presentation coming to the College of Complexes. Um, and we want to thank you and the other dedicated members of World Beyond More for contributing to the cause of peace. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual here uh, regarding justification for war in the Roman Empire. I'm a historian. Every single military excursion of the Roman army was justified in the Senate of Rome as a defensive measure. They were defending Rome. So you got to be cautious about these arguments uh, that war is okay for defense. Uh, Aquinas, I'm sorry, you Christians out there. He was a crazy theologian. I should, whoops. I, I, I misguided theologian, uh, scholastic, that, uh, you know, they were contradictions in, in Christianity about being uh, peaceful or uh, allowing warfare. Anyhow, I, I, he's not, uh, you know, just to mention that. All right, from a position of ethics, we do have a philosophy group that meets once a month, uh, an adjunct of the college. But to sum up the ethical issues here, uh, there's two, I'll, I'll make it simple. Uh, one, there's a categorical, a thing called a categorical imperative in which you have a rule that says a standard such as do not tell a lie and you never vary from that position. Now, the other side of the coin is, is called, you know, a more, what I call moral calculus, where you say, well, should I tell the truth or should I lie? Well, what would be the outcome? You know, it's a cost benefit analysis. I think you've got to avoid moral calculus. On, on another area from philosophy, I'm always amazed at the basic book on government is Plato's Republic. And he had three categories of citizens. At the top, he had philosophers such as myself. In the middle were merchants, uh, the merchant class. They made things. He said they were, they were materialists. He said since they liked stuff, they might as well make it and sell it and exchange it. And the third category he had were the soldiers, the military. He said they just like physical things, so they might as well guard the city state. Uh, one other thing that came to mind is uh, there's an argument sometimes that, oh, uh, war will always be a, a condition, a part of the human condition because of its human nature. And uh, I'm sorry, anytime I hear that, uh, people always define human nature to suit the argument they're advancing. So I don't pay any attention to those uh, it's amazing how human nature always seems to be on the position you've taken on something. And last of all, on a little lighter note, uh, for Christmas, my sister gave me an entire collection of episodes of Doctor Who, the Time Lord that's on BBC. And I'm always amazed. There's all kinds of warfare that takes place in the interplanetary world of the future with Cybermen and Daleks. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's going to go on forever. But anyhow, thank you again, seriously, David, and right. the other peace advocates who joined us this evening.
thank you for what you're doing and keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to conclude with uh, my own rebuttal unless somebody else has one to give. Um, I'm just going to say this. Um, I'll, I'll give a, I might give a short rebuttal. I could give it when you're done. No, no, that, that's okay. Uh, I'll, all right, I'll go and then we'll go, okay? Okay. All right, I'll, I'll be very quick with mine, but uh, you okay. see, I think the best antidote to war today is what we were doing in the early 2000s. And that was when we were starting to connect better as a world. The thing is, I think globalization is the best way to keep the peace. Because when we are trading, we're not shooting each other. And when we understand each other, we have a common standard that we must trade by. Most people would rather see green than guns. Basically today though, because of Trump and some of the other things and the rising change in the threat of deglobalization that Trump has done through the rise of tariffs and everything else, it's, you know, we're starting to get scared with the rise of China. And then when you enter India into the, into the equation and the Islamic world that the need for mutual respect that's been coming because of the differences of it and are not recognizing them and uh, wanting to do business with each other. Um, the old adage that one of my bosses told me a long time ago, think with your billfold, not your, not your corrupt mind. We'd all be much better off. You know, from the gift of Greece and their, um, and their granting of the democracy to the civis Romanus sum of Roman citizenship and Roman law, and of course the glorious revolution of freedom in the 17th century from the Magna Carta to the Constitution and some of the other openness of, that's of those things. And of course, Adam Smith's infamous book that was also written when we declared our independence, the, uh, um, oh God, his book on, uh, you know, the, the wealth of nations. I think the best thing we can do to prevent war is to basically keep the trade lanes open. You know, what we, what we need are some, uh, we need some good governance and that means a worldwide type of governance, some openness and some free trade we need mobility in a decent society. And the thing is, is it's going to have to come through uh, the enforcement of property rights, the uh, respect for human rights, and a certain morality that has to maintain in the business world. And this can be done because there was a report done at the Heritage Foundation sometimes that talks about the culture of business and what happened in the United States. After World War II, and I know a lot of times people think that it's there, we had a real respect amongst each other. The CEOs of co certain companies would not let their employees suffer. For them to see their CEO, their, one of their employees taking on welfare would have been of a real embarrassment for a CEO. Now we move to profit maximization and its alternatives in the 60s and 70s. And then of course in the 80s when they said the greed was good, we just got out of touch. The importance of moral character over any economic system is imperative. And I think once we really start um, practice what we preach, and that means human rights, respect for business, respect for property, I think that's our best way to avoid war. How do we do it? Well, I think in a lot of cases, they're just gonna have to teach it and practice what we preach. That's all I want to say. And I know it's a big mouth to full to do, but how we do it, that's not for me to figure out, you know, but I do know we have um, one of the things that the wars have done is they ex when when we're at war, technology tends to change rather fast or even a pandemic like we have now. Technology's changed rather fast. And what would happen in 10 years has happened in less than one through this. I will end on this. If this many people were killed by war in the United States, can you just imagine the amount of funding that we would be spending on defending our country? And now we can't seem to find the funds to get a vaccine out. You know, okay. Um, that's my rebuttal. Ellen, go ahead. 
Okay, um, I like some of the stuff you said, Tim. Um, I, I think we've actually, you know, if, if the vaccines are good, then I think we've done a pretty stunning job of getting them, uh, you know, of creating the vaccine, um, provided it's a good vaccine. These are good vaccines. But anyway, um, yeah, um, I, I want to thank you for your presentation. I thought it was a, a very good presentation. Um, I think we've, we've got some serious issues in our country right now. By the way, Igor, if you're still there, I want to glad to see that you're doing well um, and that you're continuing with your work. Um, so um, some things that I, I do see are um, problematic is, you know, part is the polarization, um, which I was reading a little bit of a book called How Democracy Dies. I didn't read that much of it, but it was saying that, you know, this um, extreme polarization tends to lead to the death of democracy. One of the factors that lead to the death of democracy. Um, and I think it's a real problem when you have different, uh, the left wing and the right wing, they're demonizing one another, not listening to one another. Um, this has gotten really serious. I don't, you know, I don't know what we can do about the fact that I, you know, you always hear about people getting, uh, like you, like you, David, you said that you um, gave out some kind of Facebook thing or tweet or something. Uh, mourning the woman who died in the Capitol raid and you got hate mail. And I always find that so disturbing that um, people do that. And there's a lot of that that goes on. And I wonder who these people are. And I wonder if they're sociopaths or something, because that, that's just not the way of, of handling things. You, you have to, um, you know, if you're upset with somebody's views, you can um, debate them. Um, and talk about your disagreements. Um, and, you know, some of, some of the best um, people, um, I see some of the best people I see out there in terms of the media are people like um, Glenn Greenwald, who, who was one of the people who broke the Edward Snowden story, um, Matt Tybee. Um, by the way, I want to mention Ed Edward Snowden uh, just had a child. <laughs> And, um, you know, he has some really um, good things to say um, if you look at him on YouTube and stuff. One of the things he was saying that, you know, it used to be that people who worked in government were public servants and then there were private citizens. But with the mass surveillance state, now private citizens, they are private. Right, we they you know they're they're surveilling us, so we're not private anymore. And the people who are public, who are supposed to be public servants, um, like um, they're allowed to be more secretive. So it, it totally turns it upside down. Um, I also um, would recommend that people. Um, look at some of the people involved in the intellectual dark web. You may not agree with everything they talk about, but it, it's important to hear um, different sides, you know, people who are trying to be more moderate and, and different sides of these various political arguments. Um, I used to just mostly just listen to the national public radio, but now, I, you know, I, I listen to like a wider range of media outlets. And I think that's really important to listen to a more diverse range, listen and read a diverse range of media outlets. So you can get more than one side of the story. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I was really disturbed on Wednesday when I saw the storming of the Capitol um, building. Um, I thought that was very upsetting, but I also think that we don't want to overreact and, and become very repressive. Um, one thing that I find disturbing is, you know, how Facebook and um, Twitter, they want to ban people if they don't like their ideas. Um, and 
whether they, they may have some good ideas. Um, yeah, actually, um, Glenn Greenwald, the journalist Glenn Greenwald, he had some kind of story about um, Hunter Biden and Biden, and he was able to um, put it together. And it was, you know, relatively shortly before the election. It would not have caused Trump to win the election. But it would have maybe changed, you know, maybe changed a couple people's minds, um, and um, and he he co-founded he had co-founded a media company called uh, the Intercept, and um, they they censored his own story, so he couldn't get out that story about um, Hunter Biden or whatever. He wasn't he couldn't publish it at the time because his own media company that he helped co-found, that he was one of the two co-founders of, um, it didn't al allow him um, to put it up there. So now he's on Substack and Matt Tybee's on Substack. Um, so um, it's in some ways unfortunate because, you know, um, if you have a media company, you can do more um, investigative journalism. So that that's the advantage of that. Um, so um, okay, I suppose that is um, all I have to say for the time being. Thank you. Bob, you want to say something, Mr. Matter? I know we, uh, I know you are somewhat of a Trump supporter. You want to put your stuff in? Yeah, I'll say a couple things here. Um, I noticed uh, on our one of the slides our speaker had. I think he had uh, as a goal uh, ending capitalism as a way to end war, and. Uh, so that, of course, uh, right there kind of destroyed his credibility because everybody knows there's basically capitalism and freedom go hand in hand. Basically, the systems of the world are capitalism and freedom, one side of the coin. And then on the other side of the coin is everything else, Marxism, communism, socialism, Nazism, all the, they're all collectivist ideas. Uh, only uh, capitalism uh, is, is, uh, is free. So that's that's really what we want, and that's why our country, of course, is ultimately why it's tearing itself apart is because we we've tried this mixed economy, and that has never worked. You can't have an economy that's part communist and part capitalist. It won't work. It's kind of like having a sort of like having gasoline with a little water in it and water with a little gasoline on it. They're they're neither of them are any good for anything. They, you can't run your car on the gasoline with the water on it and you can't drink the water with the gasoline in it um so that's kind of the boat we we find ourselves in now uh i would like to make a, a point uh uh actually I, I posted a little thing on the chat here during the presentation something that my cousin dwight eisenhower said at his inaugural his inauguration that americans indeed all free men Remember that in the final choice, a soldier's pack is not so heavy a burden as a prisoner's chains. And he said that on January 20th, 1953, uh, when he was being inaugurated. And don't, forget um, my, don't forget my comment, political power is best achieved to the end of a barrel of a gun. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, um, so yeah, is 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 you know terrible as war is and everything. We you you uh, you know we need to be prepared for it. Things can change and get nasty uh, very rapidly. And, uh, and our speaker probably wasn't around a few years back when I gave a couple of speeches. Uh, one of them was uh, I think I called it Vietnam: The, the Necessary War, uh, based on a book by the same title, which I highly recommend everybody. And uh, then I also gave a another speech about uh, uh, the, the necessity of the Iraq war, which is really part of just our, our ongoing war we are in with Iran. Now, we've been at war with Iran since 1979, and we still are. It's been largely a cold war, you know, like a proxy war, but- uh, uh, Is there but a book on every war written like this? What's that? Is there a book justifying every war? Oh, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, but generally generally speaking, a lot of wars are justifiable. And as a matter of fact, uh, Victor Davis Hanson, the uh, 
the uh, esteemed uh, uh, professor from Stanford uh, who's written many books on war. He's a war historian besides a, a classicist um, said that uh, more people were killed off the battlefield by all these, you know, evil dictators like like Mao and Hitler and Stalin, uh, more people were killed off the battlefield than on the battlefield by us, you know, when we tried to stop them. Uh, so yeah, there, it is necessary, I think, the, to have war to to rid the planet of, of these types of people. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I don't know enough about it. I'm just kind of re researching it, but I was reading a little bit about the Peneplesian War. <laughs> and that's, that's something, you know, like I don't think they teach that in school anymore, but uh, that, that war I believe lasted for about 27 years or something like that. Um, and it was quite a, quite a big thing. I believe it was a, a, necessary, a necessary war as well. But again, I don't know that much about it. I just started reading about it. Um, uh, trying to think what else. Uh, oh, uh, somebody said that there was there was talk about uh, you know impeaching Trump and, and saying our democracy is in danger. Oh, our democracy is more than in danger. Our, de our democracy is not in danger right now. Our democracy is in danger in eleven more days when the, the Biden Harris administration. Or I should say the the hey. Harris administration takes over that's right they've got planned for us uh Trump is, for president Trump statehood for, for, for uh puerto rico statehood for washington dc they're going to end the filibuster they're going to stack the supreme court they're going to add try to add more judges on and basically what we're going to have is a, a one-party system uh and you know one party cap a uh, communist system so oh, that's wow. probably not going to go over too well uh, with with the with the right. So I mean, there's a there's a possibility that we, you know maybe we'll have a, a civil war. I mean, it's might be the only way to to that this is going to get resolved because they're already you know you can see already there's um people have mentioned it tonight now about well, you know you you know, you can't tell certain jokes at a nightclub at a nightclub anymore, you know. Do you want to live in this kind of society where you've lost your freedom of speech because somebody finds it offensive? Oh my, you know, you're offended. Uh, you know, you, you, right now you can't, you can't say do and do things cause you'll, you'll lose your job. You'll get canceled. Now this is, this is a, this is a total, you know, totalitarianist uh, ideology, this ideology that's, this gripped a large part of the country, mostly by by people that don't know anything, that are fairly fairly ignorant. Uh, so and you know ill and ill educated. Um, and speaking of which, this the, the Green New Deal again. That's a you know a horrible idea. This idea of a, the, there's you know the Green New. You know what you know what green energy does? It 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 stores energy for when you don't need it. Uh, you know, we we're going to be dependent on fossil fuel for a long, long time, simply because it's just a better solution. It works, and it's there when you need it. Um, you know, wind is wind energy is fine when the wind is blowing, and uh, solar energy is fine when the sun's out. But it's hard to store that stuff and get it where it needs to go in the quantities you need. You know, when when you need it. So this this green new deal. This is just a pipe dream. Uh, again, you know, things things the Democrats are constantly dreaming up to uh, create jobs and you know employ all kinds of pink-haired commie vegans to work as uh, diversity and inclusion managers and all these companies they imagine arising to to satisfy these these uh, you know these Green New Deal initiatives and everything. Uh, you know. It, if we uh, do anything uh, as far as like cutting war budgets or anything like that, we need to be paying off the national debt and not giving away more freebies like free edu free college education and you know green new deals and all these other commie pie in the sky ideas. And uh, that's about it. I'm tr trying to I'm going to try to uh, work on a uh, a speech uh, to give in the in the near future. 
I don't have all the details ironed out yet, but it, it may be something along the lines of uh, the most dangerous person uh, ever in the in the world, and it's not Trump. I'll tell you that. I'll give you a little, and it's not Hitler either. Okay. At this point, I'm going to shut down rebuttals and ask David Swanson to uh, strike the last word like we always do with the College of Complexes. And uh, I really feel tonight that we had a good discussion. Everybody was well behaved. And uh, thank you very much. And David, take it away. Say where to get the PowerPoint. Also, um, I'm he's I got his email. In there. David, that. I'm sure if you wanted to email your PowerPoint, you could, right? My intention immediately, as soon as you let me talk, is to answer every possible question that's been asked as quickly as possible. And any that get missed, I will be more than delighted to try to answer as rapidly as possible by email or other means. I have put my email in the chat. My website is davidswanson.org. It's my understanding that uh, Tim and company are going to send me a video of this uh, call immediately after it ends. I'm going to. It's going uh, to be an MP4 file so that you can post. And understood. I I'm going to post it. I'm going to post it along with uh, the PowerPoint uh, and anything else that anyone requests or that it occurs to me would be relevant. Uh, you'll be able to find that by morning uh, at davidswanson.org. Um, if uh, you want to contact me, go to davidswanson.org and click contact or get my get my email address out of the chat. Um, I encourage you also to, to contact World Beyond War at worldbeyondwar.org and get involved uh, in everything we're doing. Uh, and, and the various people who, who proposed inviting me to, to speak to groups and classes, uh, yes, please, I'd be delighted. And contact me by email and we'll set that up. Um, I, I was, this was a very interesting format, a uh, great group, lots of terrific questions, lots of terrific discussion. A little bit odd that there were these so-called rebuttals and I didn't hear a single thing I disagreed with until the very last rebuttal. Uh, and then I didn't hear a single thing I agreed with. Uh, so kind of, <laughs> now I'm left with the, <laughs> now I'm left to, to respond to that in five minutes. I think we should have maybe, maybe had this as a debate or reverse the order a little bit and had that that very last rebuttal at the very start of the evening. But uh, in, in any case, um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, for what it's worth, I had a slide uh, attempting, uh, obviously miserable failure, to communicate the idea that we don't need to end capitalism first and then we can end war or end racism first and then we can end war. Uh, and this was obviously interpreted by Mr. Matter as, as the proclamation that we do need to end capitalism in, in order to end war, which is the opposite of the, of the intent ended uh, communication. Uh, I actually think it's ludicrous, childish nonsense to declare that you can't mix uh, ideologies of the left and the right. I don't want the Soviet Union. I want Scandinavia. You can declare it capitalism. I don't care. You can declare it communism. I don't care, but it's what I want. Uh, it's uh, governments that serve public interests, uh, not just profit interests and not just war interests. Um, I, I think it's sad and depressing that someone would proclaim out of apparently vast ignorance that the United States has been at war since 1979 when there are of course uh, Iranians perhaps without exception who would put the date at 1953 uh, when the United States uh, overthrew the government of Iran uh, which was of course the reason for the Iranians uh, fear of the US embassy in 1970 Nine Again, we this week saw that rarity of rarities, a coup in a country lacking a U.S. embassy. Uh, people in many countries for many decades uh, have feared the coups that come out of their, their local U.S. embassy. And this is the story of Iran and U.S. and miscommunications and government propaganda on two sides. You have Iranians dating all the problems to 53 and United States uh, folks dating all the problems to 79. Uh, there needn't be any problems. Uh, there needn't be any enmity and there needn't be any war. Uh, and, and this, you know, this notion that the, the evil dictators uh, who are apparently the people who get offended in nightclubs uh, have killed more people than wars. Well, of course, 
uh, horrible governmental policies have killed vastly more people than wars, as I tried to explain, our, our putting money into the war budget kills vastly more people than the wars themselves. But World War II killed many times the number of people outside of the camps as who were killed in the camps, uh, which is you know another reason that some of the propaganda is, is so ludicrous, this notion that you have a war that kills several times as many people as a remedy for a problem. Uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> in the middle of this, of this rebuttal, we heard that, that, uh, that an ancient Roman war about which the, the speaker uh, proclaimed he didn't know anything was also a necessary war. How much, how more reckless can you get than declaring something about which you don't know anything, but which is the greatest evil known to humanity to have been necessary. Uh, this is, you know, this is a war ideology we need to get away from, uh, not just the sheer madness of proclaiming Joe Biden a communist or the notion that we can survive using fossil fuels for a great long length of time or the denunciation of pink haired commie vegans in a in a zoom that's proclaimed to have successfully been kind and polite to everyone but the idea that war is normal and natural and defendable even when you don't know anything about it well of course because once you learn anything about it it isn't defendable anymore it's 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 hideous um I was also told, and then this was perhaps a minor point of disagreement, uh, that stopping a war in Yemen would be impractical because during the war in Yemen, there are bombs being dropped. As I, re as I stated in my earlier remarks, the United States Congress voted to end the U.S. role in the war in Yemen, which would very likely effectively end the entirety of the war in Yemen, uh, and Trump vetoed it and Congress is committed to bringing it up again uh, immediately. So if there's any war that it's practical to end, if there has ever been any war that lobbying and activism in the United States finds it practical to end, my God, it's that one. Um, the, uh, uh, anyway, I loved everyone's ideas uh, apart from those. I love citizen assemblies. I look forward to taking part in everything. I, I agree very much, of course, with uh, the notion that nuclear armament is not a way to deal with anything. There's not a nuclear armed nation that hasn't lost wars while possessing nuclear arms or been attacked while possessing nuclear arms. There's not a single shred of good that nuclear arms has done anyone. There are going to be events uh, all over the world on January 22nd when nuclear weapons become illegal in over 50 countries. You can find what to do and how and where at, at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, it's going to have a major impact in the nuclear armed countries as well as those that aren't. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the last bit of, of sheer delusion I wish we could have gotten to earlier uh, that I heard from a couple people just toward the end here uh, is, you know, we, we need to move humanity off the planet in case we destroy the planet as if we have the capacity to, to, to make humanity survive elsewhere while we, we actually need to focus on making it survive here uh, and stop di diverting resources to, to, to other mad schemes. Uh, but, but there's this whole genre of our culture called science fiction in which you have this, this preposterous uh, pro proposal that, that humanity has survived into a distant technologically advanced future while still beha behaving as, as barbarians, right? That people haven't learned uh, to settle their disputes nonviolently, and yet they've survived into this future epic of, of you know, weaponry vastly beyond nukes. It, it, not possible, not going to happen. You know, this, it, 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 this kind of culture drives mad policies. Um, so I, I, I apologize for anything I missed in the chat. I don't read chats while I'm trying to talk to people. So just contact me afterwards and fill me in. I think I, I, I can't, I, I don't think that's a good sort of multitasking. Um, I don't watch television. I don't read the chats while I'm talking to people. So if all the good, if all the good points against my presentation happened only in the chat, somebody will have to get them to me. Um, uh, it, yes, we need media con education and, and criticism. I recognize, I, I recommend fairness and accuracy in reporting fair uh, as one place to go. Um, 
I, 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 I disagree, of course, and it's a hours and hours long discussion with the notion that we, we must have inviolable rules instead of, of moral calculus when it comes to these things. I, 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 I mean, in terms of individual actions that, you know, that's ridiculous. There, there are going to be times when the best thing to do is to tell a lie. But in terms of institutions, Yes, you don't set up an institution to, to torture. You don't set up torture committees as various uh, you know, liberal professors were proposing at the start of, the, of these endless wars. And you don't, up, you don't establish institutions that are allowed to murder, you know, because even if you can fantasize uh, an occasion when that would be the right thing, you're, you're creating an institution that's going to start engaging in that evil practice wholesale. Uh, so you don't, so you don't do that. There's a difference. Whenever I debate professors on abolishing war, they don't want to talk about war. They want to talk about you and your grandmother in a dark alley. And it's, and it's not relevant. It's not a serious comparison. You know, me and my grandmother in a dark alley just walked there. War happens after years of institutional buildup and masses of people in factories creating weapons and, and governments figuring out ways to avoid talking with other governments. So it's, it's not a good comparison. Um, somebody asked me to explain how we should not be depressed. Act. Be an activist. I can send you the medical studies. It is very good for your health. You can sit at sit at home and 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 dream up reasons for optimism or bitch and moan about about how horrible everything's going. Neither one is going to make you more fulfilled or happy or content than getting down to doing the work that needs to be done and ignoring the the really irrelevant question of the chances of success. Who cares? We have a moral responsibility to do the best we can, and it actually makes us happier to try. Uh, so that's what that's you know what we have to do. Um, I, I I I liked and agreed with Tim's last point about the number of people uh, killed by coronavirus, which daily is greater than Pearl Harbor in this country alone, right? And and you have the very start of this evening. Uh, I was told that the reasons wars are justified, you know, is Hitler and Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and yet every day through, through chosen optional government policies that could be reversed immediately, uh, you have more people dying than died on that day in, in Pearl Harbor. Um, and, and so um, I, I don't know if it makes sense uh, now as I wanted to, to do the poll again. I think some people have left and some people have arrived since, since we started. Um, uh, and, and I already know there's one person who who thinks wars are sometimes, if not always, justified. <laughs> but uh, I, I I'd love if if you want to 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 raise your hand if you think that wars are never justified um, going forward uh, in this world. I I think I I think I see a hand from maybe all but one person who I can see that person. So not too bad, far, far above average. I see one thumbs down uh, from one person. So work to be done. Um, we'll get there. Thanks, right. for, thanks for including me. At this point, I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, the, the video file will probably be in morning. It just depends on when Zoom has it finished because I do record in the cloud. But anyway, stick around if you wanna have our little after party and want to argue, but at this point, the College of Complexes is concluded. <laughs>